Hey everybody, this is Jason with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. I just want to give you a brief introduction to this episode because I think it'll provide a little more context going into it that hopefully will help you, one, understand the content of the episode a little better and hopefully will help you appreciate some of that content a little more as well. So in this episode, I'm speaking with Angus of The Real Seed Company again for the second time on the podcast. And if you haven't heard our first episode, we first spoke in episode three of the podcast, and we spoke all about cannabis taxonomy and the dwindling biodiversity of cannabis varieties and the illusion of genetic diversity among modern cannabis hybrids. And fast forward a little bit of time, a paper came out in this year, 2020, that directly addressed these issues. And that paper is called A Classification of Endangered High-THC Cannabis Domesticates and Their Wild Relatives by John McPartland and Ernest Small. So we both read this paper, were emailing each other, had all sorts of ideas, were really excited, and we decided to get together for a podcast episode to talk through our thoughts about the, the paper. And after listening to the episode, after we recorded it, we both realized that, one, we failed to even mention the title of the paper we were talking about. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. And then um, we also didn't really summarize a lot of key points of the paper until about halfway through our conversation. And so we were a little worried that anyone listening that's coming in from uh, with no context, that they might get a little lost. So in just a minute or two here, I'm going to very, very quickly summarize what this paper presents, and then I'll leave you to the episode to listen to us talk about it. So in this paper, which I'll repeat the title again, it's A Classification of Endangered High-THC Cannabis Domesticates and Their Wild Relatives. Within this paper, McPartland and Small present a taxonomical model for cannabis, a way of categorizing cannabis uh, that consists of one species, cannabis sativa, two subspecies, sativa and indica, so cannabis sativa, subspecies sativa, cannabis sativa, subspecies indica. And within the subspecies indica, all of the high THC varieties of cannabis fit within there among several varieties. The subspecies indica contains four primary varieties that have been identified so far. And within our extended conversation, you'll hear that, um, you know, we have some ideas how they're could possibly be more varieties, but these four varieties of cannabis sativa subspecies indica are as follows. Variety indica, which would be most similar to what we colloquially refer to as sativas. These would be true South Asian domesticates that have narrow leaflets with a leaflet length to width ratio of greater than six, which means that the length is at least six times that of the width and then we have variety Himalayensis, which would be kind of the wild type version of these indicas. Then we have variety Afghanica, which would be kind of true Central Asian domesticates and what we colloquially would kind of refer to as indicas. And these would be plants that have leaflet length to width ratios of less than six. So these leaflets are wider uh, and broader. And then we have variety Asperima, which is kind of the wild type version of these Afghanica plants. And basically this paper pre presents a botanical key for identifying these plants in the hope that by being able to organize these plants and identify them, we might be able to preserve the genetics and ultimately preserve some of this dwindling biodiversity. And really this paper is a call to action for people to really start wrapping their heads around how to talk and categorize these plants so that we can get to the project of saving um, this biodiversity. So in a nutshell, that's what's going on with this paper. Uh, we're not going to talk much about cannabis sativa subspecies sativa, um, but if you really um, want to know the drill down on that, it's basically uh, two varieties of subspecies sativa. There's sativa and spontanea. A spontanea would uh, be what most people would refer to as ruderalis. I'm not going to get into the, the details of that. Read the paper, read the supplementary material that goes along with McPartland and Small's paper, and it'll expand more on that. But our focus is really on subspecies indica and these high THC land race cannabis varieties. So that's, that's pretty much it. And as far as how this relates to the cannabis you're going to get in the dispensary, as Angus will say in the episode, um, it means very little. All of the cannabis that's in the medical markets and adult use markets 
are all extreme hybrids, and this whole idea of differentiating indica sativas and everything, it doesn't even make sense um, in that context. Um, so anyway, that's a summary of the context for this. Once again, the paper that we're talking about is a classification of endangered high THC cannabis domesticates and their wild relatives by John McPartland and Ernest Small. I recommend you look that paper up and read it before listening to this episode if possible. And also go back and listen to episode three of the Curious About Cannabis podcast where you can hear the first conversation that Angus and I had about land race, cannabis varieties, um, and biodiversity and all of that. And with that, I will leave you to the episode. So thanks so much for tuning in. And as always, stay curious. You're listening to the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Hey, everybody. This is Jason Wilson with the Curious About Cannabis podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in once again. Uh, Today, I am really, really stoked. I am joined with one of my early guests and friends that I was able to talk to at the in the early days of the podcast, Angus from The Real Seed Company. Uh, thanks so much, Angus, for being willing to come back on. We've got some exciting stuff to talk about. Oh, it's great to be back. Yeah, it's a really exciting paper, this. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, so what we're uh, going to be talking about today relates to our first conversation that we had, um, which is all about, um, well, our first conversation went in a lot of directions, but um, talking about cannabis taxonomy. So there's a paper that came out just this year, uh, by John McPartland and Ernest Small, both of who we talked about in our uh, first conversation. And specifically, this paper relates to um, land race varieties of cannabis and uh, talks about the importance of preserving those genetics. So um, this has really come around full circle, and I'll go ahead and prepare people and say that between the actual paper and the supplemental material there's about like 150 pages worth of uh, material to go through it's essentially yeah. it's essentially a book <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> but uh angus what um before we get into the nitty-gritty details of uh what was presented here and uh, my thoughts and your thoughts and kind of how it meshes with your experience in the field uh, what were your initial impressions upon uh reading this paper well, I mean, it's um, so far as the taxonomy goes, my instinct has always been to defer to the experts. And as far as I can see, Ernest Small is, is really, you know, the taxonomist to defer to. He um, specializes in all, in, in all kinds of different species, but he's uh, been publishing about it since the early 70s. All, all the kind of legislation is based on his work. Um, <clears throat> so I was fascinated to see that he has come around to the view that the, the two main domestic domesticates, the two the two sort of cultigens of uh, subspecies indica, are now do merit formal recognition as uh, as uh, varieties in the in the strict uh, botanical sense. And you know, he's, uh, they, they've done between them, McPartland and Small have done the work to sort of justify that. Clearly, they've been looking at herbarium collections all around the world, it seems. And I think they say it's about one thousand one hundred different accessions they've they've looked at and yeah clearly they're satisfied that this is justified and 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 also you know this is more than just a sort of um pedantic exercise it's uh Mm -hmm. actually quite important to get people to start taking conservation of these plants seriously because if if, if you look on the uh, genesis database i think there are about 1400 accessions of uh, cannabis sativa the species um, in in gene banks around the world, but out of those, there's I forget the exact number, but it's a, a piddling amount. I mean, there's a four or something accessions of sub of subspecies indica. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, oh, five. I'm sorry. So five. Wow. Five. Yeah. Um, so this is a you know really ser- serious situation. I mean, this is an incredibly important plant, and uh, it, it's it's it's. Uh, I think they actually understate how 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 critically endangered it is. I mean, they m- mostly what they talk about are sort of anecdotal examples of of people introducing hybrids or or non actually not hybrids. It's most of the examples they give are from the seventies and eighties. So, um, and mm-hmm. and mostly seem to involve people bringing. Um, they talk about one uh, guy I forget his name who 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 says he brought some Mexican seeds to Afghanistan in the 
in the early 70s and then they they mentioned that i think cherniak or someone talks about bringing um afghan land races to nepal in the 80s but uh, you know what they don't talk about is is the whole seed industry with the online online seed industry and if you were to look at the the shipping lists of of your average dutch or british um seed company it would make for horrifying reading i mean the the, the online sort of uh internet commerce has basically yeah, yeah, it's, it's only yeah. just, it's only just arriving in places like india and, and southeast asia mm-hmm. so uh, uh, i mean amazon has just opened up some huge um uh, business park sort of type of affair in in hyderabad in india i think so they're all geared up for um online commerce coming to india so in the next couple of years uh, god knows what's going to happen i mean it's, it's certainly already started uh, people shipping hybrid seeds into india and places yeah. but i mean we're really looking at a, a race against time and um it's uh yeah it's a serious situation so this is part of getting people to take it seriously i think it's quite an important mm-hmm. part of it to persuade some um, people like the millennium seed bank and so on to i mean who've, who've got one one accession of cannabis i think you know it's it's uh yeah really not good enough yeah and and i want to point out to folks that um i really recommend they listen to our first conversation before listening to this one all the way through because some of the uh, points that you and I tried to make in that first conversation was um, not only the confusing history of cannabis taxonomy and everything, but the importance of preserving the genetic diversity that still exists mm-hmm. among these true land race strains before um, they're totally contaminated. And something that McPart- McPartland and Small point out in this paper is that there's a possibility that possibly, you know, quite a lot, if not most, of um, genetics are contaminated at this point, um, that it's hard to yeah. differentiate. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting um, was um, you mentioned in our first conversation how you could get a sense of the contamination that a land race strain has experienced by looking at things like the morphology of the seeds and uh, morphologies of um other parts of the plant, the leaves and stuff like that. And I found it really, really encouraging that all of that was echoed in this paper that McPartland and Small both um, pointed out um, as part of their uh, key for identifying these uh, defined taxa that they've put out there, that the the size of the seeds and um, the leafy tissues that are around the seeds and everything, that those are identifying characteristics uh, to try to differentiate between those domesticated and those wild type varieties. Uh, so I thought that was really cool that you had already pointed that out, but now we've got it really defined as a, you know, as a true way of, of diff- trying to differentiate these wild type versus domesticated um, um, cannabis gene pools. Yeah. Um, I mean, I hope I did justice to Ernie Small's take on the whole thing in that previous one, but it's, yeah. uh, I suspect in some aspects I might have slightly misrepresented it because it's probably worth backtracking a bit to give a picture of of what he'd um what, sure, what, yeah. his, what his previous taxonomy was because basically it's been it's been vindicated on the sort of simple issue of cannabis just being one species uh, and there's yes, plenty of yeah. genetic research has been done that shows that it clearly is and that it does seem to split very accurately into two subspecies if if, if you look at um the paper McPartland and Guy did, I think, where they compared the sort of degree of genetic divergence. They looked at these things called DNA barcode mm-hmm. gaps. And, and it showed that very clearly that fiber types in hemp, or whatever you want to call it, but, you know, hemp, let's say, and then, and then marijuana, as in uh, subspecies indica, they clearly, they clearly do split at the level of, uh, of, of, a, of a subspecies, basically much like um, large leafleted uh, tea and uh, small leafleted tea the the um the business of uh, domesticates and uh, wild type um seeds yeah that's a, a very important aspect of sort of differentiating between those two types of plants so um yeah wild type seeds tend to be small and they tend to have these um uh, elongated bases and these abscission zones all of which is about um uh you know, the, the, uh, they're adaptive traits that enable the plant to survive in the wild. The, the seeds fall off the plant as they mature. <clears throat> and then the seeds themselves have a very sort of uneven germination. They, 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 they will 
take sometimes months or perhaps even years to to germinate and these are all um survival traits basically yeah whereas um in domesticates the seeds tend to be larger they tend to stay within the inflorescence mm -hmm. and um this is a this is a trait that can take centuries they, they think to develop once a plant is brought into cultivation but yeah that that aspect of it is um kind of well well established and i mean these are observations that were made long before and a small i mean vavilov noticed this and mm -hmm. other people independently noticed it of vavilov when when they were looking at wild plants in the in the himalayas and so on but yeah i mean the the thing with the whole in colloquial kind of indica and sativa um label ernie small was of the view that these types of plants are very clearly cultigens hence because they're the creation yeah. of of mankind then they don't merit formal recognition uh as in latin latinized names yeah um and and that was you know his kind of conservative take on it um and you know it's it's in, that's in line with all the, the sort of theories of taxonomy which is thing right. is a domesticate um it certainly doesn't deserve to be recognized as a species so that was the mistake that uh Schulte's made and and um you know uh, clark and 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 hillig made it if, from from a from a sort of traditional taxonomy point of view now i mean the interesting thing is that now they've now that McPartland and small have been and studied all these um herbaria specimens they have come round to the view that there clearly is a pattern of diversity within the subspecies indica that is the result of natural selection and adaptation and isn't anything to do with human beings they they reckon um yeah so so you, so you have um basically a central asian population and a south asian population and sometime at least 32,600 years ago at least uh these appear to have diverged due to, to the different climates of south asia and central asia and uh and, and these, these are basically the you know the it, it, these are the ancestors of uh right. indicas and sativas in indicas are the central asian type and uh, sativas are the south asian type and 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 yeah they've 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 supported their case with i mean a, a huge amount of work and uh um you know there there are many more questions to be to be answered how 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 early did this split happen because it, i mean the t yeah. 32,600 years ago uh date is based on uh one pollen sample from uh central india in the highlands of uh, madhya pradesh um and they reckon that uh, ancestral sativa populations probably arrived in india over the far eastern himalayas so they they sort of came over from somewhere like yunnan in southern china and uh managed somehow to make it over those mountains into india now if you look at the climate for that part of the world and there's not not a, not a great deal of uh, work of any kind has been done in that part of the world northeast india it's a sort of one of these black yeah. holes a bit a bit like central asia so far <laughs> as academia goes and um it, it, but yeah if you, if you do look at it it does appear to have been a quite dry uh environment at that mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking about the the late um pleistocene so uh before the last glacial maximum um but at that point it appears to have been quite a cold but quite dry environment so mm -hmm. the type of environment that you could imagine it would be possible for cannabis of its own accord to work its way across um other species have done it so it's a plausible theory meanwhile uh the ancestral indica populations were, were you know over in um places like xinjiang and tibet and uh, and and so on i mean i don't know if you want to go back sort of right back to the beginning because it, it i know a lot of people really like to have sort of the, the big picture to put all this uh right yeah uh, exactly yeah into i was just going to say i mean to to kind of uh go above the conversation a little bit in elevation mm. here to give people context um what mcpartland and small have presented here um which we've we've touched on pieces on but some of the the highlights i guess would be one that um this paper is primarily focused on uh what are considered drug type varieties yeah. of cannabis particularly and um and they admit that that they they're not their focus is not so much on um all of the the fiber hemp uh type of plants and everything at least for now i'm sure they'll get there 
They, they um, hint at it. They hint at it because they, they anyway, yeah. go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so what they're presenting here is basically a way of one resolving the colloquial sativa indica usage to try to provide some clarity um, so that we can basically all get on the same page on how to talk about these things and categorize yep. them. Um, but then also how to use this organizational structure to understand how genetic diversity is changing in the cannabis gene pools and what we can do to, to try to preserve them. And some of the, the big takeaways that some people will probably be interested in are, you know, what is this taxonomical structure? So what they're presenting are for, for every drug type variety of cannabis that exists, there is one species. And, um, and that's, you know, cannabis sativa. And we've talked before about how there are, uh, this, the monotypic model of cannabis has reared its head many times because you can't, it's hard to prove anything otherwise. Anyway, um, they looked at, um, a lot of different factors because technology has changed. So they, they looked at not just morphology, not just, um, chemical profiles, but also genetics. And when they looked at chemical profiles, they focused on THC CBD ratios because concentration can be influenced by all sorts of factors. So that doesn't really make sense to focus on concentration, but THC CBD ratios are more genetically controlled. So they focused on that. They also looked at uh, terpenoids, which I thought was great. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, but they noticed some patterns um, around um, how certain um, varieties uh, seem to lack key um, types of terpenes that give them their characteristic smells that people throughout, you know, millennia have, have noticed um, as cannabis has been evolving and changing um, that in certain areas of the world, cannabis seems to be more sweet and, you know, other areas of the world, cannabis seems to be more skunky and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So they, they kind of honed in on that. Um, but I'll, I'll kind of pass it off to you if you want to kind of explain um, the new taxa and particularly also I'm interested to hear how this has affected your work in collecting these land race strains because what I noticed was you immediately after this paper went out um, tried to provide clarity around your seed catalog to help people understand what your seeds would be classified as under the new model um, you know to the best you know of your ability which I thought was a very um, very cool thing to do. I didn't notice any other seed companies doing that. Uh, I still haven't noticed any others actually doing it, and especially as quickly um, as you implemented that change. So do you mind explaining um, what's changed um, and um, and what do people really need to take away from this if they're really interested in trying to understand the differences in these varieties and the new names that they're going to see on your website and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean... Uh... I've tried in my sort of um, layman's way to apply their new uh, formal um, taxa to, to to what I've collected, um, and it and it's tricky because the areas I've been to and, and know well, uh, such as Pakistan, for example, right at the intersection of where um, you know sativa and indica meet. So, I mean, just to just just to give the actual names, uh, yeah, the wild the wild type Central Asian populations, the wild type sort of uh, putative ancestral populations, they're calling var asparima, and then the wild type South Asian populations, they're calling var Himal himalayensis, and um, the 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 meeting point of those two is more or less somewhere around the Kunar River, which separates uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now, in my experience up in the mountains mm. in northern Pakistan, most of what we've seen are the Var Himalayensis. That's not to say there, there aren't uh, the Asparima type there, you know, as in with the, the um, obovate, uh, oblanceolate, sorry, is the, is the better term, oblanceolate leaves, so mm -hmm. that those classic sort of indica shapes. I'm sure they are up in Chitral because I know other people have, have, have seen them up there. But um, what I experienced back in like 2007 when I was there in Pakistan, it, it, it made me very confused. 
because I'm not a botanist. So what I was looking at, I was thinking, you know, this whole Indica sativa thing, it doesn't make sense to me. But that's because I was in Pakistan where these two uh, types of plant meet. So I was seeing a lot of intermediate, ah. I was seeing a lot of intermediate type okay. domesticates, uh, and, and I, uh, which seemed to be, didn't seem to fit neatly into this, this uh, uh, the colloquial Indica sativa thing. And of course, the reason for that is this is basically a, a, the zone of maximum diversity for, for, for subspecies Indica. And uh, a, a lot, of, uh, you know, after a couple of years, it dawned on me, uh, much as Clark mentions in his work, uh, that a lot of these domesticates are hybrids between land races. Um, in fact, many land races, probably most land races, are hybrids between other land races. But what you have in somewhere like Chitral in, uh, in Yarkun Valley, which is the upper reaches of the Kunar River, if, if you grow seeds from there, you'll see a whole spectrum within one uh, land race, as it were. You, you'll see these big sativa type plants. You'll see these uh, mm. small um, indica type plants with the classic indica leaflets. And this is growing out one accession of seeds, you understand. So you go to a village like Patrangaz in, uh, in Yarkun, which is the famous uh, charis producing village in Yarkun. You take a, one batch of seeds from one farmer there, you grow them out, you'll see a whole range of variation. And that's because these appear to be uh, hybrids uh, between land races. And um, you, you'll also see very, very big four meter tall uh, plants with indica type leaflets. And not being a botanist, I was baffled by this. Of course, if I was a botanist, I would have yeah. quickly realized that what I'm looking at is, a, is, is clearly a hybrid uh, a population. And, uh, it, but this is nothing new. If you look at the um, lists of accessions on the supplementary material uh, for this new study, um, you'll see that they were seeing these intermediate forms uh, from accessions back in the 19th century and uh and and um even vavilov was finding them so he uh collected some plants in what's now called nuristan which is also just down just down uh if you if you follow the kunar river from its source in yakun down through chitral into afghanistan you get to this place nuristan which uh, was in vavilov's time was called kafiristan and mm. and uh in it hit one of his accessions of a i think it was a domesticate from Nuristan was uh, it, it is is uh, clearly an intermediate uh, is, is clearly a hybrid between an indica domesticate and a sativa do domesticate, as you'd expect because this is the frontier between these two populations from Central Asia and South Asia. So um, yeah, now now it all makes sense to me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I sort of uh, <laughs> I was very puzzled by it, uh, and and also I the other thing I'd screwed up was that. I was relying far too heavily on Vavilov's, Vavilov's accounts of his own uh, material. And, he, and he's notoriously inconsistent and he changes his mind about things and he hedges on things and he'll have one idea at one point and another idea at another point. But uh, it, I, I had sort of assumed because he said in his, I forget if it's the 1929 or the, I think it's the 1924 account. Uh, well, anyway, in, in his earliest account of his expedition, he... Um, he, he says, I hadn't seen these oblanceolate, as in indica, leaflets anywhere else in Afghanistan, except for in the Kunar Valley where nobody's growing cannabis. Now, he was wrong. Mm -hmm. that, of course, people probably were growing cannabis around there. But he was also wrong in that his accessions from northern Afghanistan, when they were grown out by Sarah Briankova, they uh, actually did show indica type leaflets. So <laughs> when, when, I, when I looked at his own uh, tables and stuff in, in his paper, he was, he, 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 he was saying, oh, the only, the, only, the only plants he listed as having broad leaflets were the Chinese ones. Now, he gives the length measurements for the Afghan, Afghan land races, but he doesn't mention anything about the mm -hmm. width of them, of, of the leaflets, and, or, or, or the shape. Well, you know, he does mention something about the shape. He says he claims that nothing else had these oblanceolate leaf, leaflets. <laughs> Actually, when when uh, McPartland went and looked in the herbaria, uh, he he in, in the Vavilov herbarium, he found that um, lo and behold, they actually did have the classic indica leaflet shape. Uh, and just to say, when we're talking about the leaflet shapes, um, Small and McPartland have got a kind of formal system for establishing 
what an indica leaflet shape is and it involves measuring the fan leaves as they're called sort of uh, at the base of the inflorescence you you look at the central leaflet and then you take a measurement of the widest point of that leaflet and how far that is along the leaflet so they do a ratio basically a, a six to one or something it, right. it, it, anyway I'm, I'm anything involving numbers completely throws me but they've got a formal a formal basis for establishing what uh what the ratio is yeah it's uh it's a uh, i'm i've got the paper here just to refresh my memory it's yeah. um the length over the width is usually greater than six so over six to one that ratio of um length to width for uh cannabis sativa subspecies indica yeah uh, uh anyway i mean it's it, it it's 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 sort of uh I think a lot of people in the back of their mind when they when they were looking at Ernie Small's previous system where you just lump um, indica cultigens and sativa cultigens into this one uh, subspecies indica via indica, they, they all sort of, I, I mean, I, it, was always, it was always niggling at me, which is that the, the argument is, well, these are both indica and, indicas and sativas are both domesticates. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the 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 conservative only small original argument was that they're both domesticates so they're not meriting they don't merit uh formal classification in the varieties of their own but i was always thinking well but this this leaflet shape that leaflet shape is surely not something that people have selected for it's surely yeah. indicative of natural selection of, of of something that's happened independent independent of humans now, I mean, because there there are many other traits of uh, of of, um, uh, of of sativa cultigens and indica cultigens mm -hmm. that are clearly are the result of of uh, of human selection, such as um, uh, Afghan, you know, hash plants have these uh, resin glands that very easily detach from the bract yeah. and from the leaf, and that's clearly something that's been favoured by centuries of of uh, sieving for sieving hashish uh for example i mean there's a, there's many other aspects of it but that, that, that clearly indicate uh human I involvement but um anyway you know this is this has finally solved the puzzle for me uh, yeah 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 well and it's um you know it's yeah it's really fascinating because this is it's it's like everything's congealing for me now um, because this whole story has been so confusing. Like you pointed out, especially with Vavilov's work and then um, looking at Schultes and Anderson between the three of them, things have gotten, had gotten so confusing because <laughs> you had Vavilov using terms inconsistently, depending on what year you read some of his writing. And that was very, mm -hmm. you know, early on um, in the 20th century and then you get to the, you know, the seventies and there's this focus on, you know, there's like this battle between taxonomists of those that want to focus on morphology and geographical origin sometimes, and those that are more interested in trying to look at um, differences in chemical profiles. And they weren't quite at the point that they could really look at genetics in a very sophisticated way yet. So there was this, this sort of battle between do we value THC and CBD concentration as a taxonomical tool, or is that irrelevant? Should we just focus on morphology? And then you had issues related to the accessions themselves too. Um, you know, like you said, one, there's, there, there aren't a lot of um, herbarium samples available. I mean, there are uh, relatively, but compared to a lot of plants, not really, and not that capture the genetic diversity throughout time like we'd uh, like to see and that's for a number of reasons but one is that you know to make accessions of cannabis throughout the 20th century um you had to do it under a you know a specific um structure in order to do it legally yeah I, um one thing i would say um v vavilov i think has been vindicated by this study in so far as Later on, he came to this view that there is a sort of Central Asian and a South Asian, you know, region that these two separate regions, and and recent work has uh, absolutely confirmed that they talk about these separate floristic regions. Yeah. They're called 
which are very clearly regions in which natural selection has taken plants in completely divergent directions. So uh, Vavilov's South Asian region is they now call the Indian region, and his Central Asian region they call the irano turanian region, I think is the word. So that's basically the, the these are the two uh, main, re these are these two regions for subspecies indica. Uh, just to say, because we haven't mentioned it yet, the, the formal uh, terms for indicas, as in the domesticates, it, it, uh, mm -hmm. is, is var afghanica. And right. uh, the formal term for sativas is, is var indica, as, uh, as before. But yeah, they've, uh, they, they have sort of, I think, vindicated Vavilov in that sense. But yeah, I mean, his, his early, early work is particularly confusing. And in the, in the supplementary material, they do quite a good job of showing just how bad an observer he was about some things. Like uh, his 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 wild um, his, his wild populations in in Kuna, in, in Kunar, which were growing in amongst maize fields, uh, as they point out, and as I've seen for myself in Chitral, growing cannabis in a maize field is a classic technique for for just uh, making sure no one sees it. And um, right. so so up in up in uh, Yarkon Valley, what the farmers will do is they'll sow ro a row of maize, row of cannabis, row of maize. And, uh, you know, so these, these were obviously cultivated fields he was looking at. And similarly in uh, Xinjiang, when he saw these patches of cannabis around people's houses, these, all of these regions, Xinjiang, Afghanistan, uh, northwestern Pakistan, there is very, very little uh, arable land. So nobody wastes a single bit of space. Everything is utilized. Um, so the, the, you know, the likelihood that anybody would uh, have any unused land is pretty much zilch. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, and that, that in itself, this whole question of the types of cultivation you get in Central Asia, irrigated cultivation, that kind of thing, and, and the, the, the difficulty of finding good land, I'm sure that's a crucial uh, consideration if you're, if you're looking at the sort of early pattern of how cannabis was domesticated in these uh, regions. Yeah, and uh, one thing that I really like about this paper that I really recommend people check out is there's actually a map of um yeah. let's see if i can find it here of the accessions that they looked at and to show yeah. the geographic regions that are covered and it's really cool because it shows um what you were describing at the beginning of our conversation of where you know these uh different varieties meet in the middle yeah. and you see this this mixing of diversity and then um yeah, in right in northern Pakistan, yeah yeah yeah, so I really recommend people check out that map. And I'll actually, um, you know, one thing we talked about before the interview is trying to get some images to accompany this mm. episode. And I think that's a really good idea. I want to do that, um, especially if, as long as we keep this episode less than three hours, that should be easy to do. Um, <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah. But this is an this is an image I definitely want to um, try to get on there to show people because it it just makes everything we're saying so easy to understand and digest. Yeah. And you can just see that map. And I also want to point out just to in case anyone's missed it, you know. So what we've mentioned so far is that um, this new tax taxonomical model, while it focuses on on the drug type varieties, it does state that cannabis is monotypic, one species. And one of the the arguments they make for not budging on that monotypic model is there's no way to prove anything about the putative ancestors of cannabis. So basically we have what we have to work with and the best we can tell based on the genetic testing. You were mentioning the uh, differences in the barcode. Um, That's for the, for the DNA testing. Divergence. Yeah. 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 The subspecies divergence and everything. Yeah. And trying to see, yeah. Do, do these varieties when compared to other types of plants, do they genetically seem like they're varieties or subspecies or radically different species, that sort of thing. And, and, and focusing on the drug type varieties. So when we talk about, you know, these higher THC varieties of cannabis, they're all cannabis sativa subspecies indica, and then that's been broken up into four varieties. Yeah. And so you just mentioned that what people normally think of as um, indica is this variety Afghanica, which McPartland had already um, pointed out, I think back in like 2011 or something, a long time ago now, um, he pointed out that our 
vernacular needed to change and that it would make more sense to call these things Afghanica. But now it's really getting into a more formalized way where you can actually apply a dichotomous key and identify these things. Yeah. And then what we refer to as sativa plants are now considered um, these uh, this variety of indica. And then um, between those, we have the domesticated sort of versions of those and the quote unquote wild type versions of those. So just to just to kind of make sure that we synthesize all of that in case anyone listening has gotten confused at all. The drug type varieties, you've got four varieties. The two main ones to pay attention to is what you used to think of as indica should be formally called cannabis sativa subspecies indica variety Afghanica. And then what we normally talk about colloquially as sativa, you should think of as cannabis sativa, subspecies indica, variety indica. Um, yeah, no, and just, then just just, just to stop you, sorry, but the, the yeah. crucial thing is is that this this all applies only to authentic land races. So yes, you, you, yes, 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 yes. None of this applies to indicas and sativas as as as, as you you buy in the coffee shop in Amsterdam or. Uh, or you know, in a in a dispensary in in, in North America, uh, because al almost certainly all of those are hybrids of these two formal uh, mm -hmm. varieties. So this is all only exactly. applying to Asian Asian populations. Uh, yeah, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, very 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 important point to note, um, and that's something I wanted to get into because in our first conversation we talked about how most of the cannabis that the majority of people in the world are exposed to. Um, has such little diversity at all mm -hmm. and that there's this illusion of diversity. And I was really pleased to see that McPartland and Small called that out. And they yeah. explicitly talk about that um, all of this cannabis floating around that, yeah, that we're colloquially calling indica and sativa in the dispensaries, usually that's only de defined off of... Um, you know, the THC CBD ratio or someone's subjective experience. They list, I love that they list the example of AK 47 as <laughs> this example of a, yeah. a strain that has won both the uh, sativa category and the indica category yeah. in um, some of these, yeah. these competitions. Um, but yeah, excellent point. I mean, anything, anyone listening that um, is getting cannabis from a dispensary and they hear people talk about indica and sativa, all of that is, I mean, it's just noise, really, um, because these plants have been hybridized so much, especially because of prohibition, um, you know, has really driven that uh, to a, a huge extent, but also just beyond prohibition, just for hundreds, thousands of years, the way that humans have selected these plants, we've, we've ended up um, hybridizing them to the point that there's no meaningful distinction between them uh, when it comes to this level of formal categorization and everything um i mean the hope is and and they're that they do sort of um hedge on this a bit in the paper but the hope is that there are still uh yeah. land races out there and I, and I my experience i think points to there still being authentic land races populations out there that that do still merit formal recognition and you know are representative of authentic uh domesticates so you know um there's another question, and I interrupted you before you got to it, but with the um, the ancestral, putative ancestral po populations mm -hmm. of Asperima, which is the Vir Asperima, which is the uh, the wild type population. Let's say wild type, because wild mm -hmm. type is a good way to sort of hedge on whether these are truly Aboriginal Indigenous yeah. populations still, or or whether they're representative of a mixing between domesticates and and Aboriginal populations. Uh, but there's Asperima and then there's the Himalayensis. And, the, you know, the quest, the big question is, are there true uh, Aboriginal populations of either still left? And I, and I think Small and McPartland are hopeful that they might, there might be places in South Asia, for example, where you might still have um, Var Asperima that hasn't been uh, affected by exchange of pollen with uh, uh, domesticated populations. Uh, if there are, they're probably somewhere over way in the far northeast of India, like Arunachal yeah. Pradesh or somewhere, which, as far as I know, doesn't have much of a history of cultivation. As for um, Var Asperima, uh, the you know, ancestral indica wild type populations, I think it's pretty unlikely that you're going to find 
true Aboriginal populations of that. Uh, and, and the reason for this is that, again, if you look at that amazing map, you, you see it sort of uh, going from the Tian Shan up on the northern borders of northwest China, sort of curving down through the Pamirs, down through the uh, Afghan Hindu Kushes, that, where they have all the um, accessions of this fire Asparima type plant. Uh, all of those regions are regions where there's been cannabis cultivation for millennia. So the likelihood of uh, there being um, true, true Aboriginal, uh, un, uh, pure populations of uh, Varasparima is pretty limited. Uh, uh, the same goes for the um, for the Indian Himalaya, from Indian Kashmir down through uh, Himachal and Uttarakhand, Nepal, all the way down through into Sikkim and into Bhutan. Uh, pretty much all those regions have hist a very long history of cultivation going back at least two and a half thousand years. So the chance of there being uh, wild type plants that are truly Aboriginal is, is uh, that, you know, that, as in haven't yeah. had exchanges of genetics with domesticates is very, very uh, small indeed. Uh, that, that, that sort of um, brings me to some criticism or well, questions I have about uh, um, some of their paper, but maybe we can leave that till later. But uh, just to say, I mean, uh, I, I thought it might be worth kind of uh, sort of um, zooming out a bit, just because I, I know from my own experience, it's it's very difficult to uh, contextualize all of this, um, yeah. with, with, it, or rather to sort of understand it all without contextualizing it all. So I mean, this this whole process uh, of of the creation of cannabis itself, uh, as it were, it, you know, this goes back sort of 57 million years or so when India wasn't even part of Eurasia. It was sort of drifting off the coast of Australia somewhere. And then it, 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 it kind of floated in and smashed into Sumatra, it smashed into Burma, and then eventually 57 million years ago or 50 million years ago, actually smashed into Tibet and, and, and then began this huge process of the Himalaya and the Tibetan plateau uh, yeah. uplifting. And then this this caused this radical change in the climate of Eurasia, of, of Central Asia, and um, it, it resulted in the kind of creation of a steppe climate on the other side of the Himalaya in, in places like Qing, Qinghai, which is northeastern Tibet and Xinjiang. This this was the, what then caused um, cannabis, which didn't at this point exist to diverge from its nearest ancestor, Humulus, the, the hop. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that's, that sort of puts this in context. I mean, when we're talking about humans, uh, we, humans didn't even exist at this point. We didn't come into the story until the very, very, very last tiny kind of fraction of it. Yeah. So, 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 so humans aren't, don't even feature in this yet. And, and, and uh, so from, from Qinghai, which is this, um, Part, it's, it's in what was once called Amdo, so north northeastern Tibet, and this is uh, um, uh, 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 a sort of step climate you've got created here. From from there, uh, interestingly, it appears that cannabis kind of headed off westwards first, uh, probably yes, in, yeah. in seeds in the stomach of birds migrating and this kind of thing. And it, it, anyway, fast forward another forty odd million years, or and it, Six million or so years ago, you find cannabis suddenly appears on the Western steppe over near Europe. Mm -hmm. And um, it was considerably later that it actually ended up in uh, China proper. And I'm going to have to check my notes here because I can't actually remember when it was. But uh, it, it, it first appears in uh, China. Oh, by the way, I, I, just, to, just to clarify, it was 27.8 million years ago that cannabis diverged from the hop. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, 6.3 million years ago, it's made it across to Europe, as in Europe in the sense of the Western steppe. So mm -hmm. it's about kind of Ukraine, Russia type sort of area, uh, Southern Ukraine and Southern Russia kind of area. And then uh, 2.6 million years ago is when you first find it in China proper in, in uh, Ningxia. Uh, so, you know, human, when, by the time humans, uh, rock up into Eurasia, uh, sort of sixty thousand or hundred thousand years ago, sixty thousand right. years ago, cannabis is is across much of Eurasia, uh, except for Southeast Asia. But you know, it, this again 
um, all fits into Vavilov's picture mm -hmm. that cannabis was probably domesticated at several different sites because it certainly was available to be domesticated at several mm -hmm. different sites in, across Eurasia. Um, but yeah, so that I hope is some sort of context. But again, when we're talking about actual domestication, that's even later still. You know, this is um, we're into the Holocene now, kind of a 10,000 years ago when it could even possibly have happened. But there's no evidence for it really happening until, I mean, you get to some finds from Japan about, mm -hmm. uh, and if, if I can just switch to uh, BC, BCE now, because I, I find it really hard to think in terms of 1,000 years ago once we get into this kind of thing. So, right. I, so the, the, the beginning of sort of domestication of, uh, of food crops and stuff, we're talking kind of 10,000 BC um, in the Levant and stuff, and similarly over in China. But you don't see any, I mean, cannabis doesn't really get, we don't see any indication yet. There's no evidence yet of it being domesticated properly until uh, sort of, let me check, but I think it's like in, in, in the, in the, over in the sort of um, towards Europe, it's, we're talking about kind of 3000 BCE-ish, that mm -hmm. kind of that kind of point there's 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 some in some domesticated pollen probably yeah. associated with the yamnaya culture and yeah then, i know um, um there are sorry, records yeah. that go back to like 2700 bc i know is one number um yeah where they uh and i, I think it's been pushed i'm i'm sure it goes further mm. back than that but as far as what we have actual you know pretty good evidence for uh, yeah we know we can go as far back as 3000 bc yeah, it's um yeah you're you're right. It's uh there's there's the finds in in Yangshao in in China, uh, which are sort of um or the Yangshao culture, sorry, uh, in China, which that they've got definitely clearly domesticated seeds. But I mean, even this is kind of tricky because, um, you know, uh, that there was a, certainly a kind of um, hunter gatherers themselves probably would right. have unconsciously been domesticating cannabis because of the type of plant it is it was really well suited to that because the, because it, it it naturally grows on um kind of uh, nitrogen rich soils next to uh rivers and stuff and that was its natural environment it it, it, it tended to that's what it, that's where it likes to grow so when people would have been there hunting and drinking and stuff they probably would have picked up plants uh, hunter gatherers that is would have picked up plants and then transported them back to their camps where it then would have um found a really favorable environment in kind of rubbish heaps and around you know where people were crapping and stuff so already you have this unconscious um process of people bringing back the types of plants they like to their um living areas so one of the really early finds from japan sort of 8000 bce really interestingly the seeds have no clear wild traits they appear to be partly domesticated ah. so you've already got this kind of likely to have this sort of un unconscious domestication mm -hmm. process and, and 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 that 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 trait of the seed being domesticated goes with the seeds staying inside the inflorescence yeah which is a which is an early uh you know that's that process takes centuries for uh, uh, um uh, a, a crop to uh, for, for a, a wild plant that's being cultivated to become a proper domesticate, as in lose yeah. those wild traits, that process itself takes centuries. So, yeah, I'm sure you're right that it, it actual domestication is likely to have been happening a lot earlier than the actual evidence we have for it. Um, right. Yeah, and and something I want to you know point out too is this this whole idea of um, you know trying to figure out if there are any um, examples of true aboriginal cannabis you know still in existence um this is something that doesn't just affect cannabis this is something that um you know mcpartland and small point out that this is an issue affecting um all domesticated plants that we have today that there are very few domesticated crops that we work with now that we can go and and see you know a specimen of the the true aboriginal type that would later be you know, turn, you know, artificially selected into what we see now. Yeah. Um, and so this isn't necessarily a, uh, a unique thing that we can't, you know, that it's hard to figure out whether there are any examples of these, but, um, 
you know, it is a um, an interesting target now that we have this model for thinking about yeah. these land races that this provides botanists with tools to then go and search and try to see um, if any of these still exist and if so, yeah, what we can learn from them. And that's absolutely. that's to me one of the really exciting things is you know this this is a this empowers researchers to now go on the hunt with uh, more in their tool chest than they've ever had before. Absolutely. I mean, this is why it's not just a, a sort of pedantic exercise in classifying things. It actually enables you to focus in on where to look and what to look for. Absolutely. It's, um, it, you know, and, and I, may, I may be wrong about the whole question of there not being uh, uh, true Aboriginal populations um, left in, in uh, um, some, some of these places. Uh, who, who, who knows? Um, right. Yeah. It, 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 um, although that sort of, that whole question does um, relate to some of the questions I've got about the paper. Uh, I say questions. Yeah, let's go into that. Not not criticisms, but questions. So, I mean, one thing I would say is that, as they do mention, um, many of the accessions they have uh, from Afghanistan, say, and uh, I, I seem to remember from Nepal as well, they 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 sort mm -hmm. of straddle. That they're intermediate. They they straddle um, formal taxa. So often they're um, often the Afghan accessions are sort of midway between Var Asparima mm -hmm. and Var Afghanica. Uh, and, and that's what you would expect in these places because very often farmers don't, um, when they're cultivating hashish, say, bother to cut down the weedy uh, plants <laughs> that grow around the villages. And actually though, I mean, actually though, there's, there's sort of, in, intriguingly, there are good reasons why not to do that. So for example, in the Himalaya, when you're, um, up at you know these extreme altitudes of that some of the villages are at um uh you know up what 1500 meters up to sort of uh close to 3000 meters in some cases um the, normally those are temporary villages when you get up that high uh sort of two and a half thousand meters they tend to be seasonal but they will mm -hmm. grow a crop up there and then cut it at the end of the season and, and then you know as winter approaches but there are good reasons why it makes sense to not uh, cut down the uh, Var Himalayensis sort of type plants, um, b b because uh, they're hardy. You know, they they're naturally selected to, mm. to grow there. So it actually makes sense for, their, for them to be swapping genes with the domesticates, because domesticates tend to be, you know, uh, softer plants. They don't tend mm -hmm. to deal with these extremes of climate so well. So there's actually a kind of logic to it, whether it's conscious or not. Uh, to, to not cutting down the, the wild relatives of domesticated crops, um, and, and but this this brings us to the the other question I've got, which is about their var Himalayensis uh, taxon. Uh, I, I I I personally like have a sneaking suspicion that Himalayan domesticates uh, may possibly merit formal recognition as another variety uh mm -hmm. and, and they don't um they don't uh have a i i, I sort of in the supplementary material the, the, the they don't have a, a i don't think a very good hold on what the typical himalayan domesticate is like uh, sorry just to clarify they would categorize the himalayan domesticates as var indica uh, and and the wild himalayan plants as var himalayensis now right i, I I personally, in, in my experience in Nepal and in the Indian Himalayas, most of what you see in terms of the domesticates there are triple use uh, plants. So ah. they're, they're domesticated for use as fiber and for edible seeds, large edible seeds. And they're also um, obviously used for production of charis. And they don't, That's I, interesting. I, yeah, I mean, and this is—I mean, I know that supplementary material is, is sort of is there to help people. So it's, this isn't their actual kind of. It's, it's you know it's criticizing it is not sort of you know it's not whatever you know basically. But um, they slightly misrepresent the the material from the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission, for example, about Kulu Valley, which is uh, Kulu and Parvati region is very very well known now amongst aficionados because for its charis. Now, actually, if you look at the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission, they do mention. There are domesticates 
uh, every house in Kulu Valley is they're quoting some other research, by the way, in the Indian, Indian mm -hmm. Health Drugs Commission. But every every village, every every house in 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 uh, in, in Kulu Valley has a crop of of, of uh, cannabis outside it. They they say this, you know, it's a small plot, and that's mm -hmm. that's the case. Actually, even even up from Chitral, you know, which is technically Central Asia, but all the way down, all the way through uh, Kashmir. Although I don't, I, I mean, I haven't actually been to Kashmir, but uh, Himachal, Uttarakhand, all the way through into Nepal, as far as Kathmandu, you, 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 um, the typical Himalayan domestica is a triple-use plant. And if you, they do talk about actually the quality of the fiber from plant from the domesticates in places like um, Almora. Mm -hmm. It had a very, very high percentage of bath fiber. It actually had more than a lot of European hemp land races did. Um, now, you could say perhaps that's because it was uh, a hybrid of European hemp. Sure, yeah. Because there were attempts um, to cultivate European hemp in India. But to the best of my knowledge, they didn't bring them up to the Himalayas because they very quickly realized that they weren't going to succeed in growing hemp. This is in the 19th century I was talking about here. Uh, actually, even, even before that. But they quickly realized that they weren't going to have any luck producing hemp in the Indian plains. So people like the uh, East India Company, the British, who were really struggling to find enough hemp at this particular point mm -hmm. uh, for, for fiber for the, for the Royal Navy and stuff, uh, they quickly realized that if they were going to, to use India as a source of hemp, they may as well just use the hemp that was from the Himalayan land races up in the, up in the mountains. But anyway, um, I've digressed, but I, I think if you're, I'm not a taxonomist, but I would guess you could find a set of characteristics that's con uh, that's consistent enough to justify classifying Himalayan domesticates as an, as, a, as another variety, and uh, one of the characteristics they mentioned for Himalayensis, the wild type plants of South Asia, is that they seem to have hollow stems and quite a high percentage mm. of bath fiber. Now, this I think is a is a problem because basically you've got this philosophical issue here of kind of circularity, when, <laughs> but it's kind of. But I'm being pretentious, but. But the, the, the thing is, these are, these are crop weed complexes. All of the Himalaya is a crop weed complex. So traits that are being selected for in domesticates are going to pass on to the wild type mm -hmm. plants. It's, there's nothing you can do about it. So I, I think the fact that Himalayensis has this trait probably isn't, they, they speculate that it's probably something to do with the fact that uh, Himalayensis traveled across from China, right? I think it's much more likely that just that it's because the people were selecting for this characteristic and it was passing to the wild type plants. And I mean, just to say like domesticates are planted in sort of July-ish in the Himalayas and they're cropped sort of October to early mm. November. But the seeds will drop all over the place anyway, just because people, people have the seeds in their house to eat as food. I mean, that's a, cru it's a crucial part of the Himalayan diet is is uh, hemp seeds i mean they're an essential source of proteins and fat yeah and um but this but if, if you go to these villages e even um as early as kind of uh uh march and april you will see domesticates germinating that have just seeds that have fallen out because people sit outside their house hand rubbing the charis in november seeds fly all over the place mm -hmm. when they're doing that yeah um and you'll also see the um wild type plants germinating pretty much year round if, if a village is warm enough it's low enough as on the plain yeah. you see wild type plants germinating pretty much year round in india and uh, so you have this unavoidable interchange between um the domesticated types and the wild types or, or pretty much all you know for, for sort of three quarters of the year more or less uh so there's there isn't a um uh, what do you call it a kind of uh, reproductive barrier there at all between those populations right. um Anyway, that's that's my that's one of my big criticisms of of, of the supplementary material, and and to some extent of yeah. the of the of the paper itself, I'm 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 doubtful about the the Himalayensis characteristics and um and how it relates to uh, Himalayan domesticates. I, I I'd also have some questions about how early they um their, their speculations about how early um. Uh, uh, ganja land races were domesticated in India. Mm -hmm. They speculate that it's probably started. There's, they say there's evidence for it as, as early as the 13th century, but I think it's much more likely mm -hmm. 
that actually Ganja domesticates, as in the sort of classic Lamarckian uh, indica, as in the classic sativa. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think they're quite a, a, a recent thing, would be my guess. Talking kind of 1600s. Anyway, no. I, I can I can rant about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but it, it. Oh yeah, it's it's. Yeah. It's super fascinating. I mean the uh, the Himalaya thing. You know, this is one reason why I like talking to you because of your firsthand experience um, with these plants in these regions and um, trying to make sense of all of this taxonomy stuff compared to what you actually work with in the field. Um, and that, that's really fascinating. That may be hidden within cannabis sativa subspecies indica variety indica maybe there's actually two varieties there um I, I, that... I, that's what i'm putting my money on i'm laying down a marker here yeah well go <laughs> I, ahead and lay it down anyone, yeah. anyone, anyone tries to steal my ideas <laughs> <laughs> well i'm trying really hard to uh see if i can interview uh john mcpartland and um, mm. i've got some got some friends that are friends with him that are trying <laughs> to make that happen so fingers oh, crossed because yeah, i'd love to be able to talk to him directly and you know posit some of these questions just to see what um his feedback would be um given um you know all of these sessions that they've looked at and everything and i'm sure he'd be willing to admit um certain levels of ignorance too just in that like some of these things are really hard to know unless you're going to these places and spending time and really you know um you learn different things doing that than you do relying on all of the work that's been done already with um, all of the herbarium sessions and everything that there's you've, you've reminded me because there's a bit i love in the in in the in the supplementary material because uh mcpartland i think was in nepal in the late 80s and he talks about smoking some jungly as in some biohimalayensis plants uh, i think the, the technical term uses is bio assay or something anyway they <laughs> They, basically they smoked some 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 wild wild <laughs> weed and and got really stoned uh, but i love how they describe it in the paper but uh, a bio uh, essay yeah. yeah something like that but i it, the um again i to my mind this points to the wild type himalayensis jungly is what they call it in the himalaya jungly as in like wild mm -hmm. as in jungle yeah uh it this just this this is I think just going to be the influence of uh, nearby domesticates affecting the ruderal plants. You know that's why yeah. that's why it's got high THC. I I I, I know a, a Swiss guy who lives up in the Himalaya most of the time, and he he went all around the place to trying to find like really sort of wild plots of of. of uh, cannabis that were nowhere as, as far away as possible from any kind of um influence from you know he wanted to find proper jungly basically as it because as yeah. in like proper natural weed <clears throat> and uh so he went around and he'd learned how to hand rub which is a technique that takes some mm. mastering it's not as easy as you think and and he, and he went around and he hand rubbed all this charis from these really really wild seeming uh plots and and stuff that's far away from any cultivation it it, it doesn't have a it has a it's all very generic it's sort of it as the plant and it takes about yeah you know, i mean it, it takes about 50 generations for a domesticate to become sort of to really get the uh, wild type traits but uh, anyway you know I, I i maybe these were aboriginal plots i very much doubt it but anyway these these were very very wild sort of jungly plots and and, and the point the point he said to me was that it all it's all pretty much the same you know it, the charis you get from it's very samey it doesn't matter where if it is if it's in garwal or if it's in kamaun you end up with this very sort of generic generic kind of stuff uh so you know in, in so far as these um himalayensis type populations are good to smoke and make nice charis it, it's always because they're nearby some famous charis place you know so in Kulu and Parvati, if, if if you go up to this place called Chandrakani Pass, where a lot of kind of jungly charis aficionados like to go and hand rub charis, I mean you're right next to the two most famous villages for charis in the Himal in the Indian Himalaya. So of course the the wild stuff's going to be good because it's <laughs> yeah in, yeah it's, it's constantly yeah. getting affected by yeah. everything domesticated around it. Yeah. yeah yeah I mean it's it's sort of it's sort of obvious. But interestingly, like whilst we're talking about Kulu, one thing I did notice is that there was uh, one of the accessions in their um in their list uh 
from a sort of pre hippie trail or very, very, very early hippie trail era, sort of 1962 ish uh, from Kulu, actually they classify as a, as a var aspirima. So, mm. you know, that's, so I, again, it's probably good to have maps with this because mm-hmm. we're talking about southeastwards from Kashmir, you know, on the way down towards Nepal, but uh, on the Kashmiri end of things. Uh, in in Kulu, I hope I've remembered this right, but in Kulu Valley, they've got one accession from like 1962 or something like that that's showing Varasparima type, you know, indica type leaflets, like a wild plant. Mm-hmm. And so that that's it, it, that's really on the very far f- fringes. It's not on their map, in, interestingly, but that, it's in the supplementary material. So that's really on the so very, very far southeastern fringe of where you'd expect. Yeah. We well into the monsoon, properly Indian uh, cli- climate here. So it was, it's very, it's, you know, it's slightly, it's a, it's a real outlier in terms of their theory about, um, uh, you know, uh, um, the var Aspirima population not being able to sort of uh, penetrate down into India because of, of not being adapted to this monsoonal sort of environment. Right. Um, uh, but, you know, they, again, they, they actually cover this sort of in, 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 in the supplementary stuff. Um, uh, Kulu Valley is the trade route down from Central Asia that all the charas used to be brought down. It's the main route that all the charas was imported into India from Central Asia on. So, you know, it's uh, it's possible. There's no there's no way the plants could make it, it um, over the passes that the charas caravan came down on by themselves because these are the highest passes, trade passes in the world. They're like over five thousand meters. I mean, people and, and animals used to die in their droves bringing the charas down from Central Asia. But it's possible people did have seeds with them most likely to eat most likely to eat i mean people Mm -hmm. weren't like oh i know let's bring some afghanica down and hybridize it (laughs) they would have had seeds with them because it was something to eat you know but anyway i mean it's quite possible that seeds did sort of end up uh dropping around the place and establishing themselves you know um yeah and that's that's such a that's such a fascinating um idea to think about that i think um we don't think about very much that um cannabis might spread and hybridize with other things uh simply because of the cannabis seeds being such a rich food source yeah. particularly for cultures that are growing in places where it's hard to find a lot of diversity of food and things you need nutrient dense food where you can find it um and then you know depending on what culture you're in you you may not you know, you might be vegetarian or you might not slaughter cows. You know, there's all these different other elements, too, that are affecting what you eat. And so the idea of people traveling around, you know, Asia and parts of Europe and things carrying lots of cannabis seeds that are fertile and, you know, uh, viable, yeah. that they're just eating and dropping and, and spreading. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's good reasons to think that that sort of paradigm was at play uh um uh, along the steppe corridor so uh uh sort of you know linking ukraine all the way across to mongolia uh you 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 start to see a really major increase in um uh archaeobotanical finds sort of 3000 bc ish when the steppe corridor really kind of kicked off so um that's the point at which I hope I've got my dates right. I'm gonna to have to check my notes again. But anyway, oh, I know yeah. it's roughly that point, okay? If I remember correctly, that that <laughs> um, yeah, it is 3000 BC. Suddenly, you start finding sort of east-west transmission of millet and wheat and mm-hmm. uh, oats. Uh, you know, they 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 start arriving in 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 China around that point, and um, that, at that same point, suddenly you start finding a lot more uh, what, of what may be cannabis fibers and that kind of thing all mm-hmm. along the, the steppe corridor. And yeah, like you say, I think. It's probably people one of the main reasons you get seeds moving around is because people were eating them you know um yeah. uh yeah i mean uh there's there, there's there's another really sort of interesting um aspect to that whole thing uh, with my kind of questions i have about mm-hmm. um the, the 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 focus of the study because it, it's it, it's not clear to me um how the sort of the the western and central step fit into this picture with subspecies indica uh you know that's a, that's a that's a that's a whole area mm-hmm. of of the that the that the study doesn't mention because it does appear that there was a drug you know use use of cannabis as an intoxicant whatever you want to call it 
was going on in um, in Scythia, uh, you know, north of the Black Sea, so really on the fringes of Europe, uh, in the in the late Bronze kind of uh, Iron Age era. Right, and that doesn't get mentioned uh, in much much in the study, and I, I you know I, I think partly because it's such a it, what they're trying to what what the McPartland and the Spool are aiming for is clarity, like you're saying, and it's a, mm-hmm. sort of a lens through which to see things. And I think if you get into that area too much, it just becomes chaotic. I mean, they talk about Kazakhstan, mm-hmm. but actually, to be fair, and, and how there's been hemp growing there and drug type plants growing there, and you have this sort of mishmash of genetics. Um, but what what I'm heading towards in my mind is that I, I I'm I'm inclined to think you know this is um, my personal sort of hypothesis is that early subspecies indica domesticates were were basically actually kind of Mm multi-purpose plant and that you have this specialization later on much later on into what we now which led these which resulted in the kind of classic indica type domesticate and the classic classic sativa type domesticate and actually, this was, I reckon, uh, happening much later than the supplementary material suggests. So the, um, the indica type domesticate really is a result of the sieving technique in Central Asia uh, being the main means through which uh, you know, uh, the drugs are prepared. And the, that's probably, it's not clear, but at yeah. 850 CE, you start... Uh, you have evidence in Baghdad that Central Asian Muslims and had introduced the silk filtration technique for pre- preparing uh, drugs from herbs. Ah. Um, so that's the sort of very early date, and and that that knowledge, mm. I, I've 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 imposed a bit about it being Central Asian Muslims, but it's pretty clear they were in Baghdad, which was the heart of the caliphate. Then they were getting their silk obviously via Central Asia. And, and uh, you know, so it suggests it's, uh, it's as early as that possibly that you have this right. selective, selective pressure for resin glands that easily remove from the leaves, for example. Um, but going back before that, I, 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 I think the type of plant that the Scythians would have had on the Black Sea steppe, we're talking like Herodotus 440 BCE ish. Right. Yeah, go, going back to the stories we told in our first um, exactly. interview. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I mean, those types of plants were, we know from Herodotus that they were definitely used for fiber and it was high quality fiber because he was saying that the, the textiles they produced from it were as good as our European linen, right? So it was obviously high quality um, uh, textiles being produced from them, but they were clearly also using them at very least in rituals that were derived from uh, the Central Asian smoking uh, for, to get high. And, and I don't think there's any reason to assume that the Scythians weren't getting high. I, mean, I, I think it's pretty clear that these were high enough in THC. As a lot of Hungarian sativa hemp land races are also, you know, they're high enough in THC to get stoned off them, just about. Yeah. But um, so, you know, and it's, I, I, it's a, it seems highly, highly likely that they would have also been eating the seeds. So th- I think this is a sort of... Uh, I, I suspect very early domesticates were probably multi-purpose. I, I mean, again, I'm, I'm speculating like anything, sure, but, yeah. but that but exactly the same era as Herodotus, you have the earliest evidence for cannabis cultivation, definitive evidence for cannabis cultivation in what's now India, which was happening up in the Uttarakhand Himalaya. Suddenly you have this spike in hemp pollen, uh, cannabis pollen, sorry, in uh, mm-hmm. around 500 BCE. Uh, and, and I, I strongly, strongly suspect that's connected to the Scythians again. Uh, I mean, there's a whole story behind it. But basically, the Persian Empire had sort of expanded into Central Asia and um, subdued the Scythians up in the north and then brought them in their army down mm. into con- conquering India. I uh, see, yeah. So the, the Persians wanted to get into India for its wealth. Uh, you know, the same yeah. story that happens to India time and again. But the, right, yeah. <laughs> mentioning no names but <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah i mean it's so they, they were they were there basically to extract wealth out of india and they used the scythians in their army and suddenly you have this huge spike in uh, in mm-hmm. in uh, cannabis pollen up in the in the indian himalaya and i think i suspect that's probably because they, there was a sudden economic a new economy basically and mm-hmm. they, they the brought army, with them army and yeah. of occupation needed uh fiber you know but mm-hmm. 
the question is, you know, we'll, we'll never know, I don't think, but was it the Scythians who actually were involved in cultivating it? Uh, it's quite possible it was. It's quite possible that some people, some Central Asian nomad groups didn't want to be part of this new empire. And they thought, well, sod that, we're going to go up into the mountains and, and uh, do our own thing. But Himalayan domesticates, you know, are, as, I, as I've sort of said, they're multi-purpose plants. So it may be what you have in the Himalayas now is representative of the kind of oldest mm -hmm. form of, of Central Asian cannabis use. Yeah, it's the highest. Gosh, yeah, that's but. yeah, but but that's that's the fun stuff though. It's like you know we we know what we know now, and you know you take these pieces and try to piece together this narrative that, like you said, we may never know. Um, but I think that's a very good you know educated guess about you know what very well could have happened. You know the, I think it's it's almost no question that that dynamic happened to some degree, and so it's like how significant you know, of a degree was it and, and what effects did that have on, you know, um, how cannabis, uh, you know, um, changed in that area over time. Um, you, you mentioned, I think, I think you mentioned, right, bringing, bringing the seeds with them, right? Because I mean, that's right. That was always a question mark in my mind. Would people brother bringing seeds with them? And, and all the evidence is from the sort of very early um, movement of, uh, uh, you know, hundred sort of, uh, of uh, movement of domesticated crops out of um, the mm -hmm. Fertile Crescent into Central Asia and, and you know, uh, um, out of the Fertile Crescent across the ocean, up uh, across the Mediterranean, up into Europe. All the evidence is that people, uh, people bought the, the crops with them and, yeah. and, and they bought the animals with them. So, you know, that, that's at least very early on, that was the established paradigm is that people do move the seeds around. Um, you know, so obviously, I suppose, but I mean, it's just, just, it was always a question mark in my mind, would people brother bringing cannabis seeds with them? And it, mm -hmm. the sort of, as, you know, the precedent is that they do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's possible that that's what happened in the Himalaya is that, that they actually, these were Central Asian, uh, genetics originally brought in there and that they then, um, adapted, but yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and and you just brought up another point too that if uh, people were bringing um, any sort of uh, domesticated animals with them, or you know, uh, for food or whatever, could have been using cannabis seeds for feed uh, for other animals too. I mean, the, um, the, certainly, the, like, um, I, I, there are certainly people who use the leaves for to feed animals in. Yeah, in, yeah, and the leaves uh, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's. Um, it's interesting, I suppose. The one thing we haven't mentioned is um, the really early, the earliest definitive um, uh, evidence for actually smoking cannabis and using it as a as, as an, an intoxicant. Yeah. Uh, which is it, um, over um, on the, the the western edge of Xinjiang, in uh, in 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 what's now northwest China, and and these are in a really interesting sort of location in terms of what we've been talking about in terms of people moving um across central asia and mm -hmm. uh and and uh yeah there's so there's the i think the most the most fascinating one is the is the very very new one from this 2019 study by this guy run and a, a bunch of other people and it's um it's it's in a place called tashkur gan which which is uh this um it's uh, right on the sort of uh at the foot of these passes that connect um Xinjiang through into uh uh um into the Hindu Kush. So we've already we already talked about uh Chitral and the upper, mm -hmm. upper yeah. Kunar River. So this place where they found these uh we talked about it before, these um braziers with the uh, uh a lot yes. of uh TH, you know, CBN, sort of degraded THC yeah. uh, residue all over them that were being smoked in these uh, f funeral uh, rituals. Um, again, that sort of links to what the Scythians, we, we know the Scythians were doing in, in on the Pontic Steppe. So this this place, I, I just realized it when I was sort of preparing for this, that this place, Tashkurgan, where they found these um, things, it's like, it's, it's, it's at this sort of prime location for kind of hybridization of... Uh, of genetics and stuff because you've got this trade route going through in into the hindu kush and uh 
um, it, it also it's also possible from there to go across Kashmir and, and down into India, but it's an incredibly it would have been an incredibly dangerous route to go. But the the route through over Borogil Pass and then down into uh, Yarkon Valley into Trial, and then there's another route that they could take, which goes through um, uh, over the Pamirs and then to, in, in towards Balkh and all these definitely very ancient centers of cannabis cultivation. So Tashkagan's right there, sort of on this 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 uh, linkage point so you have this you, you you know you may well have this sort of hybridized hybridization going on there people are carrying seeds backwards and forwards with them uh and yeah you know this is uh uh, uh like a you know also a um iranian ethnically uh iranian mm -hmm. uh area uh even now uh the tajiks who, who are there are sort of essentially you know they're, they they speak uh dialects of, uh, of iranian uh, of iranian languages farsi and stuff um and, and that would have been the case uh pr well pretty damn sure would have been the case way back uh you know right back to 500 bce -ish. and it didn't really start to change until the chinese um uh early chinese uh, uh han, han dynasty got interested in opening up uh the the, the, the central asia and the steppe to to, to trade and, and and stuff um and and the same with um uh the 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 slightly earlier find from northern xinjiang uh this is again highly speculative but those people certainly weren't uh um han chinese they they, they were um definitely Euro uh europoid uh they, yeah. they they may well have been from one of these groups like the tokarians or the uh you know sogdians or something but um they were all <clears throat> smoking uh, cannabis, and it, clearly it was a subspecies indica that they were using. Um, and and when you when you keep going east from there towards China, it seems pretty early on the Chinese turned against uh, cannabis intoxication as being not a yeah. Chinese mm -hmm. thing to do. You know, so you have this uh, divergence between the Chinese uh, um, yeah. subspecies yeah. that of a hemp land races and the drug land races of the, of the central asian uh, mm -hmm. region yeah because my my understanding as far as how um sort of the 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 chinese saw the intoxication related to cannabis and everything is that i don't i'm so bad with dates i'm not i would never be a good historian but i remember um there was a shift where they really only talked about the seeds and using the seeds for therapeutic purposes, seed extracts, um, and that sort of thing. Um, and they they did make different other different types of preparations, but a lot of the references you see to cannabis in Chinese literature is usually about the seeds more than anything else, more than about resin or uh, you know other uh, well, other uses of the plant. I mean, what it what what you have is. Um... So we're talking like uh, actually just at, um, just sort of around the point of those those finds that we've been talking about those those um, the Turpan ones and mm -hmm. the Tashkagan ones uh, you know as in the earlier sort of definitive evidence of people smoking to get stoned around that same time you you have uh, a very early Chinese dynasty called the Zhou Dynasty it's spelled Z H O U but the Zhou Dynasty and mm -hmm. uh, in the Eastern Zhou they this is actually uh, an early reference to the intoxicating properties of cannabis that you have these jade tablets uh, on, on which you have the name for cannabis, which is ma in Chinese. Yeah, you have that yeah. written. And uh, this, this, the, this actually, the, the connotations of that are actually of numbness and sort of stupefaction. And, that's a, and the, the negative spin on that is that I've given that in the translations is intentional. It, yeah. it, it's, it's, it, it's not a positive uh, term, you know. Positive connotation is quite a negative connotation. So that's that's as an early reference to the to the you know pro probably the, one of the earliest uh, references to 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 the fact that this plant can get you stoned. Um, but it, it's still around that point in 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 um, in, in in early Chinese uh, literature. I mean, people like to talk about how it goes back to two thousand seven hundred BCE and stuff, and that's that's not that's not correct. In, in China, there's not sort of writing about the, the writing you have about the, the, the effects of cannabis is, is, is much, much later. It, it's sort of um, 
during the Han Dynasty and subsequent to the Han Dynasty. But the, the information itself clearly reflects knowledge that is very, very old. You know, so they, the Chinese knew about uh, uh, pistolate and staminate plants and stuff like that. Uh, and, and it was probably knowledge that goes back to the sort of late Neolithic and stuff. But but in, in terms of uh, what you were saying, um, that you, you come to this point when the sort of uh, in the Han Dynasty, which is this crucial point in the history of uh, China, where you, you can really start to talk about China in, in the sense that we now under, sort of understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and yeah, you do have in the, in the writing about um, cannabis, you have this kind of odd silence about certain aspects of it. Uh, which if you look into the, some of the sort of commentaries and stuff on, on, on medicinal text, you see, well, there was this very negative association with getting stoned because it was associated with kind of witchcraft and sorcery and yeah. shamanism and, and Central Asian things that the Chinese were increasingly keen to sort of distance themselves from as, as they became more and more Confucian. They, 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 they started mm -hmm. to regard these steppe cultures, which incidentally, they'd got loads and loads of things from the steppe cultures. And, and the early Zhou dynasty was very connected to that type of stuff. But, you know, as they started to build the Great Wall and all these classical, these classic sort of mm -hmm. aspects of what we think of as you know, China proper, they were more and more uh, distancing themselves from steppe cultures. And they were having these terrible problems with groups like the Xiongnu, uh, who were uh, probably the Huns, basically, mm -hmm. the same people who trashed the Romans and stuff. Uh, yeah. subsequently. Uh, they were having terrible problems with these types of nomad groups on their borders. Uh, meanwhile, they were also very keen to find out what was going on, uh, they being the Han Dynasty, were very keen to find out what was going on in Central Asia. They were keen to trade with Central Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, so they sent these guys like uh, Zhang Qian and stuff out into uh, places like what are now Tajikistan, you know, to find out what was going on, possibly to make some alliances with other nomad groups to, to kick the Xiongnu out and that kind of stuff. But uh, from that point onwards, you, you have them talking about two types of ma, you know, two types of uh, fiber plant. So they have hanma, which is the Chinese fiber plant, which is hemp. And then you have huma, which is, it can mean a multitude of different Central Asian fiber type and seed type plants. It can mean sesame, for example. Mm. But it was also applied to uh, uh, cannabis. But huma meant like a Scythian hemp, essentially. Scythian cannabis, basically. Mm. Uh, barbarian cannabis. I mean, hu, hu is another, hu is a very negative term in its original connotations it, it, it means okay. sort of uh, uh uncivilized um that type of thing uh if, if you if you use it to refer to a person in in modern chinese you're basically yeah. saying they're a, 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 you know, an ass basically uh, but it, it's sort of it's a very rude uh term in many of its connotations so basically it means barbarian or it can mean yeah. foreign. it can refer to any of um, it can refer to like the language of the Hu could mean the Sogdians, the Scythians, the Xiongnu, the Tocharians, all these different groups. But essentially, they're distancing themselves from this type of cannabis that gets you stoned because it's associated with shamanism and yeah. non, non Han behavior. So you've well, you more or less got the, the Great Wall, and then on one side of it, uh, the Chinese type of uh, uh, cannabis is in, in, the, in, the, in the Han Dynasty when we're talking about, so sort of 250 BC ish. It's it's being used to produce all the paper, you know, mm -hmm. and that paper is is what's creating the, this huge bureaucratic, highly ultra civilized culture. Uh, it's what they're right. writing, on, and they're using it for seeds. And there is some medicinal use of it, but the type of mm -hmm. cannabis they've got is clearly not that. It's already it suggests anyway that it's not that got that much intoxicant potential. So that it, if if it's used in anesthesia, it's used in mixtures with stuff with other kinds of plants. And then on the other side of the Great Wall, you've got the steppe. And you've got the, the, the you know Central Asia, and, and and you've got this huma, like as in subspecies indica, basically. Right. Uh, yeah, I, I know they would make a um, like there was some sort of anesthetic wine they would yeah. make out of cannabis. It's another one of those things of like, well, also alcohol helps with that too. So yeah, yeah, um, they're, they're, they're having to mix it in with other things because of itself, it's not, you know, doesn't do the job. Yeah. yeah. And I I can't help but notice the obvious similarities between how China at that time as a culture handled the plant and how the United States in more recent history has handled it in terms of trying to distance away from the intoxicating varieties, but, you know, we're still willing to play with, you know, the fiber type hemp, creating a separate word for 
these intoxicating varieties that have a negative connotation towards them to kind of encourage the society to, you know, stay away from that. And um, uh, othering is what the sort of fashionable sort of uh, social sciences word for it. They're basically using it to other people. And yeah. it's, exactly what, it's exactly what Herodotus was doing, although albeit he didn't mean it. He didn't, so when, when he described the Scythians running around, you know, screaming and shouting after just getting stoned, it, 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 he was actually interested in what they were doing. He didn't have any contempt for them at all. He was fascinated by it, but it was a sort of process of, of othering them, basically. These are, as, as he saw it, they were Asians. You know, the Scythians were Asians, not, uh, not Greeks, not real uh, Europeans, you know. So, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it totally mirrors it. Yeah, the, yeah. The modern modern uh, thing, and it's it's also to do with being the right kind of uh, uh, in in the Chinese context. It's about being the right kind of um, uh, citizen, you know. So the Confu mm -hmm. yeah. Con Confucian uh, the Confucian idea of society was really absolutely taken hold by that point, and and a Confucian a, a good Confucian citizen doesn't a, a good Han person doesn't um, lose their um, presence of mind. Their wits. Yeah, you, 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 and, and and they certainly don't dabble in the occult and that type of stuff. You know, that's not that's absolutely n doesn't happen. You know, that's not 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 what you do. So um, yeah, it was all it all fits into that same paradigm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it it really does. It makes me think about um, so within the United States where I grew up in Mississippi, where the culture is um extremely conservative and um you know not just Christianity is so dominant, but certain uh, flavors of Christianity are so dominant in mm -hmm. these areas where it's just like that. Like, no, you don't dabble in, you know, these things we don't understand and that are, you know, associated with misfits and, you know, all of these mm -hmm. other things. And, oh, it, you know, um, uh, yeah. And in order to be the the godly person that you're supposed to be, you don't you don't mess with cannabis. You don't mess with these yeah. things that are going to affect your, you know, your state of consciousness. And you seek to, you know, sort of, um, you know, if you have an issue with your state of consciousness that you need to work out, you go straight to God with that. You don't you don't yeah. deal with, you know, it's, extraneous it, things. So it, there's a flip side to it, though, which is, I think, that exactly the same thing you're describing, except that it, I, and I, I, mean, I want to be um, again. Let's just be clear. I'm I'm speculating a lot here, but the flip side to it is, of course, that they that that also involves ascribing a lot of power to the things that you don't like, right? Yes. So 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 you know it, the um, Central Asian sort of step cultures were seen as being kind of having mystical powers that the Chinese perhaps lacked. You know, so a lot of the a lot of the Taoists. And stuff would would get a lot of their ideas from the Central Asian uh, mystical cultures, sort of Buddhism, as it, it was forming in places like Afghanistan. They, they would they would borrow like uh, ideas from from these cultures because they saw them as having powers that they perhaps lacked. And you see exactly the same thing today with attitudes towards India amongst Westerners and stuff. That mm -hmm. it's actually a kind of ironically a slightly sort of inverted form of racism, which yeah. which uh, which sort of ascribes magical powers to Indians and stuff. But uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> well, and it's so fascinating. You know, we touched on um, some of these patterns of society's relationship with, you know, these sorts of um, consciousness changing uh, plants and everything. And it, it's just so fascinating to see these recurrences of human behavior throughout time. You know, as, as one civilization pops up, they go through these you know they don't all go through the same patterns but those patterns are there and it's it's just so so fascinating to recognize and and to see how it plays out over time in some of these older cultures and to compare with things that we're dealing with now and you know i don't want to totally rehash everything we talked about in our first interview but this where we're at now of like all of these more modern civilizations trying to decide what their relationship with cannabis is going to be yeah. which then opens the doorway to well What's your relationship with other entheogenic, uh, you know, plants and fungi and things right now? And in Oregon, we're about to vote on um, decriminalizing uh, psilocybin mushrooms, for example. Yeah. And I, I know, love that's the way happening. I managed to sort of sneak these things through the federal. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's like we got the cannabis thing under control, and it's like, well, 
yeah, what about these natural products that, you know, are physiologically, you know, seem to be pretty safe and, you know, have medicinal purposes and, you know, spiritual purpose, all these different things. And so it's um, the dominoes, you know, are sort of trying to fall in that way that once you have that shift of like, no, maybe it's okay that we, you know, we at least tolerate, uh, you know, society playing with these, with these plants. Well, the thing um, it, it, sorry, no, go ahead. The, th the thing is, is that this, this weird period of prohibition we've been through is absolutely this sort of tiny blip in this. Uh, yeah. Although, as, as you've said, there are, there are kind of, you, you, you can see the paradigm at work in, in, uh, in the way that uh, cultures like China and, and the Greeks and stuff uh, viewed Central Asia. And, and, and the thing is, uh, we were talking about, it, excuse me, before we actually started the podcast, but Central Asia is this sort of uh, where subspecies indica appears to have to, uh, developed is this sort of black hole in our understanding. So it was always this peripheral, it, 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 when I say our understanding, I mean all the peripheral cultures of Central Asia, like the Chinese and actually the Indians and, 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 you know, and the Europeans, they, 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 they all had these sort of, um, they, had, they had this lack of understanding about the civilizations that were in between them, which they saw as the, mm. kind of the middle of nowhere. Uh, yeah. And uh, cannabis sort of, it was, is something that sort of got lumped into that uh, that sort of black hole of of, of lack of knowledge, um, but yeah, what you were saying in in, in terms of um, you know Amer American and Western culture generally learning to come to terms with cannabis and and how to how to relate to it and that type of thing. See, the interesting thing I I think is that actually even the sort of evangelical prohibitionist mindset uh, that um, ultimately managed to find its way into legislation was. It is again, it's a sort of a, a, a historical anomaly, but also was actually a, a, a kind of a minority voice that somehow managed to become incredibly powerful. It yeah. wheedled, wheedled its way into the politics because even the British, you know, it's easy to forget. They, they didn't want to pro pro prohibit cannabis in India. All that stuff, the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission, which is a, a, a amazing and one of the few sort of good things to come out of, in, of British colonialism, it, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it, it was all an attempt to um to actually uh, uh keep cannabis off the law books it, it was all part of this bungled attempt to sort of pre prevent um uh prohibition happening in india because the, the british were there to to extract wealth and make money they didn't want to ban cannabis because it was one of the, another thing they could tax uh but you know the tentacles of empire sort of got in a twist uh, thanks to stuff that they'd been the british had been doing in egypt as well uh the american prohibitionists had all this evidence that cannabis might make you go bonkers and uh, might make you go insane or whatever uh, so it, it it kind of cocked up and we ended up with several decades of extremely misguided law but as i'm my point is just that it, it's an it, it's a historic anomaly and we're, we're heading back towards normality slowly uh yeah. um, well and and the point that you you just said about um the british not wanting to prohibit cannabis in india because they want to tax it and they see it's you know this this big commodity to make money off of i think that's that's sort of where we're where we're at now as people rediscovering they're like wait why do we prohibit this and like how much yeah. money are you know some of these places that have legalized how much are they making in tax revenue and why aren't yeah. we you know getting our share of that um, I mean, that's it, definitely yeah i know yeah. and uh, I was, I was saying, like, I mean, it's, it's just, it's so funny watching how the the states have managed to sort of go their own way in uh, yes. in, in America, and 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 uh, I, I wish we had something like that in the UK, but sadly not. But I mean, yeah. uh, anyway, once 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 it's happened in America, Britain will tag along as always, and and, and it, it will <laughs> eventually common sense will uh, will prevail. I mean, I, oh, yeah. The irony is it's, it's one of those classic situations where more or less no one, including the conservatives in the UK, actually support this anymore. It's purely that they're scared of the, 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 the right wing tabloids. Uh, yep. Everyone who knows anything about it realizes it's an incredibly stupid thing to be doing. Uh, and uh, well, you know, now we're heading to a point where we really can't afford to be wasting money on this type of nonsense. Uh, exactly. Never mind all the other uh, unfortunate consequences of it. You know, it, um, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah. The, it, 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 I thoroughly recommend anyone who sort of has an interest in the history of it to, to read things like the Indian Hemp Drugs Commission and, and that type of stuff. And, and be, there's some new studies that have come out on uh, Afghanistan in, in that era as well. And you'll see how uh, 
you know, every every sort of sensible state. And it goes right back to the Mughals, the, the, the Turco-Persian uh, Muslim dynasties in India. They, they were all taxing it from very early on. It was nuts not to, you know, I mean, um, yeah. given that it was one of the most popular commodities in that in that region. So, yeah. Well, in um, shifting gears just a little bit, something I wanted to ask you about, um, going back to the McPartland small paper, mm. I wanted to see if something fit your experience uh, with land races there. So they, they mentioned, uh, so we mentioned at the very beginning that one of the things that they examined were terpenes, uh, terpenoid content and uh, organoleptic characteristics of these land race varieties of cannabis. And in the paper, they say that South Asian land races often smell herbal or sweet, whereas Central Asian land races give off an acrid or skunky aroma. And they're basing that off of some of Robert Clark's work in the in the 80s. Has that been your experience, that that distinction is, is that strong, that if you find land races from South Asia, they're going to be sweeter than those you find from Central Asia that that would be skunkier. I mean, I know there. You, we mentioned in our last conversation that cannabis grown in these different areas of Asia are used for different purposes, and they have different organoleptic traits and things that some you prefer to, um, you know, extract the resins and use those separately, whereas others like the ganja uh, varieties that you know you would just roll up and smoke into joints and they'll be pleasurable and flavorful. So I, I wanted to ask you about that, how that matches your experience. Well, I, yeah, I, I was slightly concerned when I, when I thought back through what I'd said with in that earlier one, that I might've overstated the extent to which you can't uh, just um, uh, uh, smoke uh, um, uh, Var Afghanica indica type Afghan plant mm -hmm. as bud. Cause I have, I have friends who, 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 who cultivate uh, these pure, well, hopefully pure land races we've been getting from, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan and, and do smoke them that way and, and say it's very nice so I you know I I, I don't want to overstate the extent to which I've in any way sort of empirically investigated this stuff sure. mostly what I'm doing is collecting and, and and talking to people and reading books and stuff I'm not in a position to grow these plants myself mm -hmm. uh, I, I rely on feedback from customers and stuff so it's a it's a it's a very sort of haphazard um uh sure. way of, of, of getting a picture of it but um Certainly, the uh, those particular terpenes—I can't remember what they're called—but they're sort of alcohol. Set, set, the with, sesquitine, yeah, sesquiterpenoid alcohols. That's, yeah. that's it. Yeah, Th that, that's definitely something. Those sort of skunky aromas are definitely something that, in my experience, is associated with Central Asian. Uh, when I say Central Asian, I mean sort of north of the Kanar, but as in sort of north, the, the Hindu Kush, basically. Mm -hmm. You see, my yeah. my personal experience of the Hindu Kush is is purely in uh, Chitral and then and and being in Peshawar. And, and getting uh, Afghan hashish and, and hashish from the, the Pakistani Hindu Kush and stuff whilst I was there and, and being up in Chitral. So it's friends of mine like Lucas who've actually been to northern Afghanistan and, and then other friends of mine I work with who, who, who know the area and uh, have contacts in the area. So, uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't sort of, unlike Lucas, who's one of the people who collects from, for me, I haven't sort of walked around in fields and Balkan stuff and, and smelled the plants and things. But yeah, everything we're seeing in terms of what we've collected it, it fits that pattern absolutely. The the, the one thing that the uh, I, the that I would say is that a, a lot, also a lot of what we what we're seeing uh, it, it does appear. Yeah, we've got pure var Afghanicas from 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 the accessions that we've got from there, but we also have a lot of what seems to be uh, um, uh, var indica var Afghanica hybrids. So mm. like. The, the 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 domesticate that um, Afghans themselves call uh, Mazari Sharif or Mazari or Balki, uh, um, it, it appears to be a very large plant, you know, which uh, um, uh, at one extreme of variation, and I've got a photo of it on the website, has can have very uh, sativa type leaflets and be very tall, mm. uh, and then other other extremes from the same um, accession, you can have extremely uh, indica type var Afghanica plants. <clears throat> so. You know, and and how exactly uh, the var indica um, uh, genetics, or, or even if maybe they're not, maybe they're um, maybe there's the influences from help, hemp cultivation in Uzbekistan that's right. hybridized with. You know, we don't we don't know yet, but um, this is another question mark in my mind about the um, the, the 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 pattern they paint because it, 
with the virus Barima and Vira Himalayensis and this uh, uh, reproductive barrier <clears throat> between the two of them. Now, it's, they've clearly made their case for that with the accessions, but I, I wonder to what extent, um, to what extent it's it's the case that it, it seems to me that Vira Himalayensis can survive beyond that northern yeah. extent. Uh, and, and, and there's some indication of that in, in the accessions they've analyzed. But, you know, it, it's, it, um, the question is, can uh, Asperima sort of cross southwards? And mm -hmm. uh, they've got that one example from, um, uh, from Kulu Valley, which suggests that it can. But I, I, I wonder, again, what I mentioned about circularity, to what extent, um, I, I don't know. Uh, what I wonder is, can the, can, what, what you might have is phenotypic plasticity. So, you know, this genetically mm -hmm. virus Roma populations, as they sort of move downwards into India, perhaps they just uh, express uh, themselves uh, differently. Express, exactly, express themselves in, in a more Himalayansis way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that seems to be what's happened when, you when people have introduced hybrid genetics into, into Milana in the modern era. Is that they end up sort of blending in? Partly, they sort of mm -hmm. blend in with the with with. You know, I mean, it's. I don't want to understate what how much of a bad thing that is. They annihilate <laughs> the biodiversity, but the phenotypically yeah. they express themselves in a, in a way that's appropriate to the uh, to the to the climate. But I, right. I totally digress from what you were asking me. But um, well, and it, you you just touched brain. on something that um, in the paper they talk about, and in in, in my book I mentioned, but just how quickly a cannabis plant, no matter how domesticated it may be, how quickly it can naturalize to whatever location it's in and start to exhibit uh, wild-type traits, which makes all of this work that much more complicated. But um, within 40 to 50 generations of, yeah. a plant, of a cannabis plant, you can have it dramatically change how it's expressing itself. Go, going in going in one direction that's we, we know that's yeah. we're going from a domesticate to a wild type phenotype right it's not right. so clear how long it takes to go from a wild type phenotype to a domesticate because they haven't yes. actually sort yeah. of studied that but but yeah it's it's very it, i mean what i've seen uh for example someone um who who who'd, uh, bought some of the lebanese we got from Bekar valley which incidentally is definitely a place uh lebanon where you've uh had uh, a, a lot of hybridization going on quite possibly between uh uh, var sativa um hemp you know mm -hmm. uh, and between uh var indica and between var afghanica i mean i've spoken to uh people i've spoken to uh um uh, uh, uh farmers in lebanon who say that there was definitely a particular individual they can name names who who, who bought um mm -hmm. afghan seeds to lebanon in the 70s uh similarly an, another uh, friend of mine uh, talks about bringing um, Balki genetics from northern Afghanistan to the Hindu, to the Pakistani Hindu Kush in the seventies and, and knows the names. But anyway, uh, so these are definitely high. Uh, Lebanon is definitely a hybrid uh, uh, zone since at least the thirteenth century, where you've had hybridization between land races. And uh, we, we I, a customer of mine was growing out um, Lebanese seeds in a very humid environment um, uh, uh, against my advice. But anyway. <laughs> had grown them out and, and they, they exhibited these extremely narrow uh, leaflets. You know, mm -hmm. um, that makes sense, yeah. Yeah, and uh, whereas uh, other people I knew were growing them in sort of um, places like southern Spain and and Andalusia and mm -hmm. stuff, a uh, very dry climate and uh, up, up in the mountains and they're expressing these much more sort of Afghanica mm -hmm. type uh, leaflets. So you have this sort of instantaneous phenotypic plasticity uh, um, uh, you know, and it, it's it's what you'd expect from a plant that's evolved uh, high up in the mountains, where you have these extremely changeable climates. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and to anyone listening, in case we haven't made it super clear, because there's a lot of things sometimes we have in our minds that other people might not quite catch on to, is that that climatic difference. The reason it's going to influence the not just the leaf structure, but also like node links and that sort of thing, yeah. is that if you're in a very humid envir environment. The plant needs to breathe so that it doesn't get moldy and you know get attacked by uh, fungal pathogens and that sort of thing. Whereas in drier climates, plants can afford to be more dense, much more leaf tissue and everything um, because they don't have that selective pressure against them. There may um, be advantages to it, like sort of slower transpiration rates and yes, yeah, and, and that type of things. Uh, um, uh, and 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 the. Uh, 
uh yeah sorry i interrupted you but um no yeah. no yeah i just wanted to make sure that was clear because we mentioned several times about um varieties moving into like the monsoon areas and all these different things i just want to make sure that anybody yeah. listening in case they hadn't quite pieced that together yet that they understand why the uh morphology is going to be affected um by those climates and and what you just talked about about um you know uh these varieties being moved around i i thought it was really cool how the paper in one paragraph talks about i mean it's cool in a academic intellectual sense it's devastating on another level but um talking about how um people would brag about how they brought uh, the example i'm looking here is they brought mexican gold into afghanistan in the early 70s and how they uh what was the other one that they were bringing in Central Asian land races into South Asia um, in the 70s and into Nepal in the 80s and Jamaica and Thailand. And um, this, uh, it, it's, it's interesting how our perspectives change the more we learn that at one time that seemed like a really awesome, exciting thing to do, that we're yeah. taking land races from one place and bringing them to another place and seeing what they do together. And now we're looking at that and being like, Oh geez, like what have we done? <laughs> you know, sort of thing of, uh, you know, we've, we've so heavily contaminated, uh, these gene pools with other land races. And I think that's something that, um, sometimes people that aren't in so involved in, in all this work, um, it can sometimes be harder to appreciate because someone might think like, well, you take two land races together, like, you know, you've got, these interesting genetics and you'll get something else interesting um and so i could see why in the 70s with the understanding that we had at that time um that that was exciting um but now we're looking back and seeing yeah. these things mexican gold panama red all these other strains that were so popular in the 60s and 70s that then got crossbred in afghanistan in these critical regions um yeah. I mean, the, the the thing I'd say with the Afghan one is it was <clears throat> the only reliable source they quote there, uh, reliable or, is that I, I Beisler or something his name is, who's the actual guy who claims he did it. Uh, Pietri, the one who they quote, is also talking about it. I'm sure is just a guy who'd read that book. Uh, he's not he's not as anecdotally from what I'm mm -hmm. told anyway is uh, is not a reliable character. But then the um the uh, then there's an Italian guy who also talks about it. But I don't know to what I don't know what the Italian academic was basing his his opinions on. It, I mean, it, the, the, re the reason I say that is because, uh, you know, since 1979, there's no way people have, it's highly, it's highly unlikely people have been bringing uh, th that type of plant into Afghanistan because it's just, it's more or less been off limits. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so it, in, in a sense, the, the disaster that's happened in Afghanistan from, a, from, from that minor perspective is, is a good, is a good thing for cannabis because it sort of kept it away from that type of uh, mm -hmm. phenomenon. But yeah, I mean, uh, what I've seen in Nepal, um, uh, there's there's one session we got from there uh, from a, um, a hashish producer who, um, which it, it it shows, I don't know, it, it I wouldn't say it shows any obvious signs of Afghan contamination in terms of it doesn't have those terpenes or anything like that, but it does have uh, markedly large uh, 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 leaves. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 my, my sense is that there's still uh, substantial zones of, of sort of Central and South Asia, and even Southeast Asia, where it's still possible to get pure land races, and 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 smaller McPartlands sort of a sort of at, at the end they say sort of optimistically we hope that is the case, mm -hmm. and and I, and I, and I, I, I think it. I, I hope I hope they're right, and my experience su suggests they're right. But of course, I'm 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 judging all this from an untutored perspective and also i have a financial incentive to sort of present it that way so I've, obviously i'm biased towards right. biased towards presenting it from that perspective but honestly i would say you know as dispassionately as i can uh, my my sense is that there are there are still populations that are unaffected and of course they're all away from the the places where foreigners tend to go and and also uh, just to continue that thought you know laos which is this uh, mm -hmm. very significant center of biodiversity for cannabis and of, of uh, for land races uh that um was off limits for a substantial period from sort of 1975 until um uh you know the uh, late 90s it didn't really sort of start to open up to tourism although um 
I have spoken to one smuggler from the sort of Thai stick heyday who says that a mm -hmm. friend of his did introduce uh, hybrid genetics into uh, central Laos uh, at one point for a, a commercial grow. But mm -hmm. from what I've, you know, from, from my, my senses from having lived there, because I lived there for four or five years, I, I, I didn't see any obvious signs of, of foreign hybrids. It, n nothing, you know, struck me as being very obviously contaminated by them. Uh, everything I was seeing, um, and 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 the way the economy itself sort of worked with the commercial grows, it 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 was it's very isolated by and large from from the type of person who's going to do that. It's not to say that people haven't, you know, NGO workers and stuff who who live there did, mm -hmm. and and people who who sort of managed to get into the tourism industry. I know that you know, they people were did, did bring hybrid stuff in to grow in their gardens and things because you can get away with it in in laos in fact you you can do it within the law now they've liberalized that you can have six oh, plants wow. in your garden now it doesn't matter because no one gives a I toss about that. it there <laughs> but, <laughs> but 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 it, it, it it's um it, it, it's uh uh yeah i mean that uh, uh, lao friends of mine would talk about safarang you know safarang is like uh foreign uh sorry um you know western western ganja you know uh it, so that people even knew about what it is but it doesn't do very well there you know because it's just a particularly bad climate for it if anything that's got remotely sort of um mm -hmm. indic indicary genetics just gets absolutely savaged uh wh whereas um you know the the, the local land races so they, they've got uh, perfectly adapted to to being grown there so if you're a commercial grower why would you want to screw up your crop with that kind of stuff if you can right if you can grow a field of the local land race um but yeah i mean uh, i'm 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 a, i'm an optimist in so far as i think it is possible it, within the next couple of years at least to, mm -hmm. to to collect representative original land races you know and and uh, and and um land races that may have also been affected to some degree but they're still worth collecting and yeah keeping. Um, absolutely i mean i think that's an important yeah. takeaway from all of this is that even if we have trouble finding uncontaminated um you know sources of some of these land races what does exist in whatever level of contamination it exists is still worth preserving still yeah. worth collecting because the contamination issue is going to just continue and get worse and worse and worse hybridization is going to continue and yeah. whatever can be captured now regardless is important but um to begin to uh, wrap the conversation up, because I think that's a, a really good um, segue, how is this research going to affect the real seed company going forward? Is it going to affect um, areas that you target, um, varieties that you target, any of that? How, how does all of this information affect the way you're thinking about the company? Um, yeah, I mean, it's... Um... Always in my mind, I'm sort of wondering to myself where makes most sense to go next, um, mm -hmm. and, and I've tried to jig everything towards um, uh, other other people who are actually from these places doing the collecting uh, as much as I can, so that I'm I'm not flying around so much and you know dumping tons of carbon in the air all the time, and and you know yeah. also not having to do these huge sort of slogs across uh, uh, you know for months at a time, which is is awesome in many ways and a huge privilege, but also extremely hard work and makes it quite difficult. Yeah. To, to 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 do all the other work I've got to do at the same time. Anyway, I, I I've I've sort of um, there are areas that I don't know anyone in that I am thinking of focusing on uh, parts of the Nepali Himalaya and uh, parts of Northeast India that I'd like to have more of. And uh, also, we were hoping earlier this year to 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 collect across parts of India itself, uh, southern India. But then you know the the COVID nineteen thing happened and just completely. Yep. Cool. Uh, but <laughs> but it, but i mean you know these um traditional indian ganja domesticates uh are, are really really important and uh, you know uh, in india is more and more linked into internet commerce so there's more and more hybrid genetics going in there um so you know the chances of finding uh, of finding uh the real thing are, are getting lower and lower each year so mm -hmm. certainly i'll focus there and wild type plants from northeast india are, 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 are something i'm particularly keen to get hold of and um 
you know, generally we're moving more towards collecting uh, wild type seeds. Uh, it, it was something that was always of interest to me, but there was no sort of financial incentive to do it. But I think as the sort of level of understanding amongst aficionados mm-hmm. and collectors it, it, of, of their significance it, it increases, then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get more of those. Um, and I'm also keen to get hold of uh, Southeast Asian hemp land races. I'm hoping mm-hmm. some our friends of mine can help me get hold of them. Uh, you know, and, and, and uh, basically everywhere is of interest. But um, I, I personally would like to go up into Central Asia because it's it's not a part of the world. I've, I haven't been to Tajikistan and and all those mm-hmm. kind of places, which are hugely important. I, I just have no idea to what extent it's feasible to collect seeds there. I don't. I have no idea what the law is on that kind of thing. So, uh, and I don't know anyone there either. So, it, it, you know, that's a, that's another hugely consequential uh, place. Uh, you know, as as this study has demonstrated for uh, ancestral Indica uh, populations, uh, I wish I could go to Xinjiang, but that's not happening. Yeah. That's a complete <laughs> disaster zone. Um, I know. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then that's another part of this puzzle too. Is you've got this these other dynamics at play. It's not like you can just wander in and collect seed from plants. You've no. there are there are all sorts of conflicts going on and uh economic devastation all sorts of really really hard things that that af- affect this work and something i really appreciated um on your social media that i wanted to give you a chance to briefly talk about is how the real seed company is working to try to support some of the locals um that are in some of the areas that um, that you've been sourcing seed from that, uh, you know, before the podcast started, we were talking about how um, COVID-19 stuff, obviously it's affecting everybody, but um, the media is not really shining much attention on a lot of these communities that are uh, really getting hit hard by this, that don't have the resources that a lot of um, countries might have, or a lot of the um sort of privilege that a lot of places have um, to, you know. So anyway, I know that you've been doing food drops or, you know, helping uh, with supporting some of these food drops that have been happening in some of the local villages and other places um, where some of your work touches. So do you mind speaking a little bit to that? And if there's any way that any listeners can um, offer their own support to help support some of these families um, that are being affected um, economically or, you know, sick or don't have access to food, you know, all these sort of things um, that are very much connected to all of this work in the cannabis plant. Um, let them know how they can get involved with that. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, um, th- this is always something I'm conscious of uh, in terms of collecting the seeds, because, you know, there's a, y- you could, if you were very unfair, sort of portray what I'm doing as a sort of form of colonial plunder in some ways, because I'm going and taking seeds from these places and making money out of it. And, and I was always conscious of that. So I wanted to find ways to, 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 to get money back to people who are actually from these communities. So one way I've done that is just to actually get them to do the collecting and, and to give them a, a, a generous p- percentage of the retail price of what, uh, of, of what we sell the seeds at. But um, another, a, another way has just been that I have, I have friends in many of these places because I've been visiting for, you know, over, mm-hmm. over many years uh, who, who work in NGO uh, outfits there or, 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 who, or who are just individuals who want to be able to help their community. So mm-hmm. in, in the case of Chitral, for, for example, that was um, from the 1930s up through to the 70s was a major center of, of hashish production in the Hindu Kush uh, after Xinjiang shut down. But then uh, in around sort of 1979-ish, um, uh, I, I believe it was, uh, the Pakistani government suddenly became very strict about production in that particular area. And so started to very heavily enforce uh, prohibition uh, there uh, relative to how it, much it had done before. And um, always promised the Chitralis that they, up in Yakun and places, that they would provide them with an alternative source of, of income, uh, which, you know, they never actually sort of made good on that promise. Mm-hmm. So this has left communities that would otherwise have been uh, ma- making money out of commercial hash production in, in, a, in a really pretty bad situation. Uh, essentially, what you have now is that um, most most families get have their main source of income from their uh, kids working down in the cities like Peshawar and Islamabad, uh, 
and they'll send they'll send money home uh, when they have it. But of course, with the lockdown, I mean, a lot of people have lost their uh, jobs there, and uh, you know, so you actually do have uh, the poorer families up in Chitral uh, are all sort of uh, small scale subsistence farmers, so they're in a very precarious situation just in terms of having enough food to get through uh, the COVID crisis. So yeah, I have I have uh, friends I've known up there for many years who uh, I've been sending uh, you know cash to. To, to help them do food drops to families. And I, I, I invited people on Instagram if they wanted to contribute. So, you know, if, if people are interested, they can email me or, or, or follow me on Instagram uh, at The Real Seed Company uh, and, and uh, just drop me a, a direct message and I'll send them away to, that they, they can send money to, to me because uh, I know a lot of people are, are, are nervous about sending money to Pakistan or, or, mm-hmm. or just, uh, don't want to have to pay for the, uh, transfer fees or to go through right, all, yeah. all, all the nonsense of MoneyGram where you have to provide all your passport details and stuff. So they, they can just PayPal me money basically and I'll send it to my friend and, and he'll, uh, he, he'll do the food drops. He's been sending me lots of photos of, uh, of him um, hauling bags of rice to, to, to families and stuff. And it's, it's genuinely really, I can, I can tell you, uh, sincerely appreciated by people. They're extremely grateful for it and because uh, they, because they need it basically, you know. It's not just a yeah. for show, you know. Yeah, and it, it puts things into perspective, I think, for people that live in places like the United States or the UK or, you know, any of these, you know, more um, um, wealthy areas that, you know, I, I look around and I see people, you know, here in the United States complaining about what's going on with stay-at-home orders and all these sort of things, and they they act as if they're so negatively affected. And in some ways, sure, they are. I mean, there are mental health problems, uh, all sorts of other things with people, you know, having to be stuck at home and with job insecurity and everything. But the people that we're talking about right now are experiencing a totally other level um, of challenge um, with this issue um, that I think hope, my hope in sharing the story and, and and I'm going to be talking about this more on my own Instagram, try to get people pointed towards you. Is I hope that it helps people kind of stop a little bit and think about what they're complaining about and what their actual situation is in life compared to, to others around the world because we get so caught up in our narrow tunnel vision of, of a life that sometimes we forget that, you know, when stuff like this happens, I mean, there are people that literally have no food, like... Like we can still, if we need to, go to a grocery store and and get food. Yeah, we've got to wear masks and do all of these different things and take precautions, but we're still able to get food. Um, there are places in the world that don't have that luxury, um, and so bringing attention to that is something I I feel very, um, I don't know, very led to do. I think it's a very important thing, and I really appreciate the fact that you're you know trying to do that work. Oh yeah, I mean, thanks. I mean, it's 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 a drop in the ocean, but it it feels yeah. it feels good to be. It's a privilege in a way to be able to help people, and it feels good to actually uh, help help out. Um, I mean, it, for me, it all fits into the a sort of bigger picture in which these uh, these communities, these margin very marginalised uh, rural uh, communities, they're the, they're the same communities that have kept these land races going mm-hmm. through pro- prohibition, you know, despite the efforts of the Pakistani government to wipe out cultivation in Yarkun, people still did grow. They grew in between their maize crops. They grew up in the mountains. They, they did, they did maintain these land races. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they're, they're the people who've, who've kept these ancient, uh, highly biodiverse populations going all this time. They're the people who were growing the plants that all our modern hybrids are based upon. You know, yeah. so I mean, ideally, once once we've returned to normality uh, and and put an end to prohibition, which is happening, it's happening in Nepal and it's slowly happening in Thailand. Uh, these these communities will benefit once again from from cannabis in the way that they should have been. It, it was a lifeline to them through prohibition, but yeah. it, you know, prohibition itself sort of, in many cases, forced the plant up into these more obscure places. Uh, in some in some cases, it just kept going in these old places like Rolpa and Rukum and Balk and and so on. But anyway, I mean, you know, these these people, if anyone deserves to to have a fair cut out of of, of the money to be made from cannabis, uh, are, are the people who should be getting it. You know? So I see it as yeah. a kind of natural justice to 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 try and you know, direct some of the the benefit back towards these people. So. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, and that's such an important thing that um, I've been thinking more and more about lately is this um, social equity piece, you know, how you have people that have been doing the work for long periods of time to ensure that cannabis has gotten to where it is now. And so how do you ensure that those people that really deserve to profit off of an economy that includes cannabis, how do you ensure they actually get in on, on that? And, you know, in the United States, the, one of the big problems with legalization that's happened here is you look at the prisons and you look at the, Mm. you know, who's been jailed for cannabis over the years in the United States. And, um, there, there aren't, I mean, there are by nonprofits and stuff, there are efforts, but there isn't a strong voice in the federal government yet about trying to release these people from prison or expunge records, yeah. ensure that they're able to actually participate in the economy that they've actually contributed to supporting to get it to this point, you know, so far. And you also see that that predominantly affects people of color, um, just the way that um, racism has also affected the yeah. application of cannabis laws. Um, and so this, the social equity piece, I think is really important. And anyone listening, I think it's something that we really need to start, um, thinking about and talking about a lot more because these dominoes are going to fall fast when they do legalization is happening all over the world. And as it's, as it happens, one place, more places view it as an acceptable thing to do. And there's this influence happening. Um, and especially yeah. when you see the money involved and everything, um, so we're we're going through this massive change and we run the risk of really you know to put it very bluntly really screwing over the people that deserve to really benefit the most from this that have been suffering in various ways or taking enormous risks to get things to where they are now so um yeah a lot of a lot of pieces to this but even beyond just the humanitarian side uh, the social equity piece of of what you're trying to do to ensure that these people are able to be active participants in the economy and and begin to benefit the way that they deserve is is excellent so um thanks for that and hopefully anyone listening will really take that to heart and, and think more carefully about about that dynamic can yeah just because i i know you i know you're sort of wanting to draw this to a close but just to say sure. i think with with land races there that there, there is potential for um uh to find a sort of a solution to, 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 to what you're talking about, which is that um, something akin to what uh, they have in the EU with the uh, uh, Appellation Controle, uh, this, um, which they apply to various types of liquor and cheese and all kinds of things. I see. But, um, essentially, uh, for example, uh, first class Nepali hashish, um it, it 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 can only it can only be the the real thing if it's produced with the real land race from say Rukum mm -hmm. or Ropa or somewhere in in Rukum and Ropa so you know it's essentially a kind of combination of the ter the terroir uh, to use yeah. the term and, and the plant itself the, the the land race itself so the way i see it there there there, there should be a solution that there is a potential solution there to to sort of safeguard uh, the, these communities' rights to these plants and these products, uh, and I and, and I don't mean to in any way sort of suggest that there isn't p huge room for improvement of these land races. I mean that mm -hmm. you could have sort of in 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 somewhere like Nepal, which is internally as, as far as I understand it has already uh, legalized everything. So. Um, you could have pr projects in some way like Rukum or Ropa where you have uh, you know, one branch of it is aimed at maintaining the land race in its, mm -hmm. in its pure form. Uh, another is in, aimed at actually improving the land race in breeding it mm -hmm. and stabilizing certain characteristics and, and producing a, a plant that you know, can compete with the best modern hybrids in, in, in whatever characteristics you want. And, and, and you can ensure that these, these uh, products uh, uh, are authentic. I, 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 another interest of mine is is tea, and I, I lived in Taiwan for many years. And uh, from what I know of what they're doing in in the um, TRES and these various uh, sort of Taiwanese um, state sort of uh, 
funded or state uh, run projects they're talking about using stuff like uh uh what do you call it your crypto uh, some these um Bitcoin. Oh, yeah yeah cryptocurrencies yeah uh, but not the currencies but the actual sort of uh oh, the blockchain technology blockchain, that's it yeah mm-hmm. so another, I, I don't know if it, i read a few studies about it and i had friends who were discussing it but a real problem they have in somewhere like taiwan is that they have uh, you know they have this fantastic terroir they have these amazing cultivars mm-hmm. that they use and they have an incredibly high quality uh tea produced in the mountains there but the problem is that they're also having their market flooded by vietnamese tea which can be surprisingly mm-hmm. good to the vietnamese oolongs uh, and and but it's very difficult for um taiwanese on the taiwanese market to know if you're getting the real thing or not but they're talking about using blockchain technologies and, and this kind of thing to ensure that the supply mm-hmm. uh it, it, you know that they, they know that this is the real the real deal basically so, right you, you basically have like a uh, a validated ledger to work with so that yeah. there's yeah yeah exactly yeah so that's, this is, that's this, really... yeah these are things i've been pondering about i mean i'm i'm, I'm ad living but you know that that to me seems like a, a a route ahead and there must be some kind of way that you can use it, this uh mm-hmm. this type of scenario that i've described to ensure that you know only real Nepali charis is 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 sold as Nepali charis, and and the same the same the same goes for communities in Humboldt, and you know communities in New York State, and 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 so on that yep. have have been hit very hard by prohibition, and and and, and at the minute are not being served well by legalization. Uh, that you can use this kind of terroir yep. Appalachian control a type system to ensure that authenticity and sort of economic justice. And not just, you know, and also redressing some of the wrongs of prohibition. You know, so um, yeah. exactly, yeah. I know that. Um, <clears throat> I know that. I think it's um, medicinal genomics um, uses uh, blockchain technology to um, handle the ledgers involved with the um, genetic sequencing that they do on cannabis plants to try to. Um, basically ensure that like once they've analyzed something and assigned it, you know, a unique ID, because obviously they they don't rely on strain names or anything. They have these just very confusing, just series of letters and numbers. That is like the unique code for that um, sample of genetics. And that as that moves around databases or whatever, they can um, use blockchain technology to ensure the integrity um of that and it's a way of ensuring that basically a third party can't come in and manipulate things in some way um that would then um you know sabotage the efforts of breeders and that sort of thing so i agree with you and i think that blockchain technology the way you're talking about using it i think it's going to spread throughout um agriculture and nursery plants in general i mean because this is something that it affects roses it affects grapes you know, all these different things that you need to be able to, um, as a, as a breeder, be able to protect yourself if you're introducing, um, new genetics. And there traditionally have been these registries, um, for nursery plants and crops and things like that. But like I just pointed out, they can be manipulated. They can be fudged by other parties, that sort of thing. They're not necessarily totally protected. There's sort of a, a trust that's placed into them. Um, but integrating things like blockchain technology can then eliminate the need for trust altogether. You just know based on the way that it's designed and the way it's structured um, that everything is is safe from um, manipulation and that the the information being shared is traceable and true. Yeah, I mean, um, hopefully, once um, McPartland and Small sort of do that, what, what I assume is going to be their next. Uh, study and and they start looking at the um you know contemporary accessions mm-hmm. and they perhaps that combined with the uh, genetic analysis and stuff can actually prove that there are authentic you know mm-hmm. what's authentic what's not what has been hybridized with modern hybrids what hasn't um it's going to be very complicated because as as we sort yeah. of briefly touched on many land races are hybrids of land races or probably all land races are hybrids of land races but some some going you know some as with like lao and thai ganja plants are hybrids that happened many hundreds of years ago some are exactly. things that have been created since the 70s like lebanese yep. uh, land race 
in Bekar Valley. But I mean, it, it's, it'll be tricky and it's far beyond my sort of ken, but I, I imagine if they can do that and establish what's, what's, what's authentic and what's not, and then you can, you can com combine that with all these other method ways of ensuring authenticity. I think mm -hmm. that's what everyone's really looking for now. And I think that's why more people are getting interested in land races is because we're all looking for authenticity these days and it's distinctly mm -hmm. lacking in so many places, you know? <laughs> and that's true on just like a philosophical level, yeah. you know, <laughs> we are, we're at the stage where we're so tired of artificiality and yeah. are looking for authenticity in so, so many levels. Um, <laughs> and, and cannabis is definitely one of those. Yeah. Um, well, before we totally sign off, I want to give you, um, a moment if there's anything we haven't touched on that you wanted to, to make sure to highlight, or if not, um, then just go ahead and let folks know how to, um, learn more about the real seed company. You know, you've got your blog. Um, I'm not going to assume that anyone listening to this has heard our first interview. So, um, you know, you've got the real seed company, you've also got quick seeds. Um, you've got your, um, blog where you share a lot of your thoughts on, on these issues as well as, as well as like linking to conversations like this that we have. Um, so I'll just kind of hand over the platform to you. If there's anything related to anything we've uh, talked about that you feel like is a gap we need to touch on, we can do that. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and wrap things up and let people know how to um, support you and find you. Yeah, sorry, there was a there was a real delay on the light the line just there. I'm sure you can fix it all in the edit. But um, yeah, yeah, um, th th there are there are quite sort of specific aspects of of uh, some of the supplementary material of this study that. Uh, that that I that I'm still pondering that I've sort of briefly mentioned like the the question of um exactly how old or new uh the classic kind of ganja um uh land races are um uh it's it's a, maybe it's just a personal obsession of mine but I have I think they 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 misrepresent some of the academic studies that they've used suggesting that Ganja land races go back to the 13th century. Mm -hmm. I, I, if you actually look at the the academic um, Moylan Bell, I think his name is. I've I've managed to find the papers, and I think they've just uh, misread what he said. Uh, he he says there's not much evidence for that. For basically, you don't see the the name Ganja until the 16th century. Really, there's Ganja Kurt and a couple of other things, but dating these texts that he's talking about is notoriously difficult. So. Yeah, it, but it, it, my my theory is that the creation of these types of high potency, uh, high THC um, South Asian land races is is something that really was catalyzed by the introduction of tobacco and the practice of smoking them with tobacco. You, you do have cannabis smoking, obviously, going way back at least to two two and a, two and a half thousand years at least, mm -hmm. and and you have pipes for smoking in that they've um found in africa because i mean smoking in pipes goes way way back in africa as well water pipes and stuff it's it's extremely mm -hmm. old there but they've found uh, cannabis smoked in pipes in africa in the uh sort of uh, i i think it's the 13th century ish kind of era so yeah and how far back do like chillums go and that sort of thing i mean that's well, I mean, going who, on a while. It, it's it's a it's one of those things rather like the diffusion of cannabis and, and the sort of mm -hmm. hybridization of, of I'm talking sort of medieval era hybridization of land races. It's, it, it's extremely hard to know what's going in what direction and what's coming from where, and is it backwards and forwards? It, it, it's almost certainly like to be a, likely to be a highly complicated picture of mm -hmm. influences going in both directions. Um, but uh, my, my theory is that, that, that uh, um, the, the tobacco was the key factor in, 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 in India, that drove the uh, selection for potency. Because if, if you look at, say, um, uh, Garcia Dorta, who's this uh, uh, Portuguese uh, Sephardic uh, Jew, he, he was in Goa in the, in the, in the uh, early 1500s. He doesn't talk about ganja at all. And you'd, you'd think if there was ganja there, he would have at least picked up on it. I mean, he was a botanist, but he just talks, right. about, he talks about bung. And uh, likewise, you don't, you don't see this term ganja until at least the 16th century. It doesn't really seem to get going until much later than that. Uh, there's, a, there's a guy called Thomas Bowery, who was a British merchant who was uh, 
um, uh, he was trading a across the Bay of Bengal between Sumatra and India, and he knew the commodities there extremely well. And he's a very reliable source. If you if you read all his stuff, he seems to be on the money with pretty much everything. And he um, he 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 says that in India in 1670 what they grew in India was bung. And he's very clear that bung is a different plant from ganja. And that sort of fits with what my understanding of this would be. Because I mean, bung itself as a, as a word, people keep saying it's a Hindi word. It, it is a Hindi word, it's in Hindi. But it, it goes back to sort of 500 BC Iranian, uh, middle, middle Persian, they call it. But it, it's a very, very old word. It can apply to, uh, to Tura, to Henbane, or to cannabis. So if you're looking, oh, at, okay. if you're looking at early Indian, uh, texts like the Atava Veda, mm -hmm. they talk about bang in there. And of course, everyone likes to think that's cannabis. And may maybe it is cannabis, but we don't know for sure. It could be a a any number of plants. And mm -hmm. I, I keep getting distracted onto different points. But the point is, my, my sort of picture I've got is, is that bang is, in, is certainly in India, as in cannabis, as in a sort of uh, a Central Asian type way of using cannabis is, is already in India certainly by the 11th century it starts this term bang starts to appear in medical texts and that kind of thing and and this guy Moylenbelt who McPartland and Small refer to he's clear that 11th century really 13th century is a sort of point at which you can say yes if they're talking about bang in this mm -hmm. text they're talking about cannabis I so see it's yeah. clear by that point bang is is a thing in India you see them uh, early Muslims in the 11th century sort of talk about um what may well be fumigation type use of cannabis in temples. Mm -hmm. They certainly talk about using it to get stoned, uh, but you don't really have a, a definitively talking about bang until the 13th century, which we discussed in the previous podcast was this really important point at which you have this explosion out of Central Asia of hashish, the hashish sieving technique goes across into the Middle East. Suddenly your cannabis is everywhere. People are getting stoned everywhere, all the way across North Africa. And it seems to be a very crucial point in India as well. And, and it's at the point at which you have the Delhi Sultanate, this Muslim culture is establishing itself in India. So uh, Indians, are, certain types of Indians are going to hate me for this because <laughs> it's basically sort of suggesting that the Muslims introduced cannabis to India, <laughs> uh, live with it. Uh, the, yeah. uh, um, the, uh, but, you know, as for actually ganja itself, uh, Bowery, this guy in the late 17th century is saying, all you have in India is this, he calls it a crude type of plant with large leaves that's bung, whereas ganja is all coming from Sumatra in a place called Aceh, which is a very significant place on the northwest tip of uh, Sumatra, which was a sort of trading point, very prosperous, ah, okay. point, yeah. going between places like, uh, you know, what's now Cambodia and, and Thailand and sort of, you know, linking that through the Bay of Bengal through to mm -hmm. places like what's now Calcutta and uh the malabar coast and you know a, a major trade route but he bowery's very clear he's saying ganja was coming from sumatra all they had in uh, in, in india was bang that bang was a very cheap product that ganja was much sought after and the sumatra and ganja he said it was much addicting to venery as in people were smoking mm -hmm. a lot of it and uh having a night on the town <laughs> and gotcha. uh and uh, anyway, it was it was a much more expensive uh, it was a much more expensive mm -hmm. product. It sold for sort of many multiples of the price of bang. So you know, my hunch is that we should pay attention to what Barry says that he's probably onto it because he should know. I mean, this guy was he was there to make money. He was mm -hmm. he was trading. He knew what the products were because he was he was taking advantage of of the disparities in spices and this uh, prices mm -hmm. of spices and this type of stuff to make his living. And he was based out there for a long, long time. Now, it's not to say that Indians didn't develop ganja, but because the Indians were based in Aceh and they were probably growing it. But mm -hmm. it's quite possible that this sort of may well be, who knows, but that the earliest sort of center of creation of these things was Aceh, uh, of this practice of selecting for potency and, and, and creating what we now think of as sensimilia, you know, this proper mm -hmm. seed, seedless product. Um, uh, and you, that links with what you were saying about the aromas of these types of mm -hmm. uh, South Asian land races. Now, uh, Lamarck himself note, uh, noted it, that, that they smelled like tobacco. Now, that's uh, also the case with Achenese, uh ganja has this very tobacco-y kind of aroma, as does uh, Lao, and, and certain types of Thai uh, have this quite 
tobacco -y aroma. And it was blended with sort of fruity scents. And, you know, when it's really good, it's sweeter. But of course, that sweet sativa characteristic, that's a, something that's going to require a lot of selective pressure, as with good tea and that type of stuff. You know, those very high levels of the amino acids and stuff that are responsible mm -hmm. for that type of thing, as far as I understand it. Now that may well be a sign of deterioration of quality since the 70s. I, I haven't, I have seen it in good tie and stuff, but it's what I've mostly seen is sort of herbal aromas, tobacco-y types of aromas, sort of leathery tobacco-y aromas that you, you tend to find in, in my experience in tropical uh, ganja. But it was something that was blended with tobacco uh, very early on and smoked. And I think that highly addictive kind of combination of tobacco yeah. and, and cannabinoids is what really catalyzed this to become a commodity that was traded for, for uh, from in, from Central Asia into India and from Southeast Asia across to India and so on. The demand for it, because <clears throat> it's around that same time that Barry was there that really tobacco had established itself as a crop in India, and it's that same time that the Uzbeks and and actually probably Tajiks were were, were first recorded as, as as introducing into Iran this practice of smoking charas with uh, tobacco. Uh, you know interesting wow yeah, yeah. So, it's, so it all comes down to spliffs yeah well yes yeah, spliffs <laughs> and nardiels and chillums and bongs and all kinds yeah. of things so everyone everyone in my experience in all these parts they all smoke it with tobacco everyone does it's very very seldom you meet someone who smokes pure and, and i like to smoke pure and when people see you smoking mm -hmm. pure they're like oh bloody hell do you really want to smoke it pure you're going to get too high you know <laughs> like, that's the point man <laughs> but yeah it's, it's uh you know they 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 uh everyone likes to smoke it with tobacco you know it's uh, it's a very addictive combination yeah. yeah yeah fascinating yeah that's something that uh personally i've i've never really enjoyed the uh yeah. the tobacco addition um right. sometimes it can yeah just really not not sit well with me i can't deal um, with cognitive dissonance I, I don't want to smoke something that i'm gonna have to worry that it's going to give me cancer it, it's just, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just what's the point you know well, anyway right yeah i know yeah and I mean, yeah, sometimes it'll, I mean, depending on, in which, that's funny, because sometimes I do smoke cigars. I do like tobacco cigars, usually yeah, like okay. a few times a few times a year. But, um, so I can handle tobacco, but for some reason, that mixture with cannabis, it is so prone to giving me the spins. Mm. I just, uh, I don't know. It's just something that I just, I'm like, I don't, I don't mess with that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I, that I, is. I, agreement it, 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 i think it's a, a dirty a dirty sort of feeling you get from it as well it just it it it, and it, it takes the edge off the buzz as well i think it, it yeah and, and particularly you know um a, a lot of uh indian ganja for example isn't always that potent it, it, it mm -hmm. i mean that, that's again that's another whole issue that the type of use of traditional use in in india is um uh it's a tonic you know it, it um mm -hmm. there's some good books on this People weren't necessarily smoking to get high. They were smoking to take the edge off very hard manual labor, difficult lifestyles like being a, a wandering ascetic, not having enough mm -hmm. food, that type of thing. They weren't necessarily looking to, to get wasted. They, they, they were actually looking to make life a bit easier. Uh, yeah. So right, that's another whole conversation. But Yeah, uh, yeah. No, that's super, super fascinating. All these cultural differences uh, between uh, how people relate to cannabis is so, so fascinating. Yeah. And I love... Every time we get together and talk, it's always so fascinating because I can always trust that our conversations are going to go in directions I don't expect, but that are super, super fascinating. Um, so that's that's just another another one of those. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to to be able to sort of rant for, especially after having read uh, uh, read these papers because my mind is sort of full of ideas and unfortunately my I know yeah. To listen to me talking about it sometimes and, and there's a limit <laughs> to how much she can put up with so <laughs> to finally get to talk to talk about it with someone who actually understands what i'm talking about and really appreciates it is is, is, a, is a privilege it's really good fun um yeah yeah definitely I've, I've really enjoyed it and if um you know as usual the invitation is always out there if anything pops in your mind um that we didn't go into that you want to dive into later um don't hesitate to let me know because i always enjoy our conversations and our listeners seem to enjoy them our conversations uh or our last interview is uh one of the most popular it is the most popular episode uh, um that we've done right. um yeah it's it was actually really cool on youtube um someone commented and they said <laughs> i i i was i was really humbled by this they said just like um 
the land race trains that need to be collected and preserved. Conversations between these two people need to be collected and preserved. Oh, right. <laughs> it's really nice. Uh, it was yeah. super. It was super super nice. I really appreciated it. So, anyway, I need to uh, wrap this up and get going. But it was a really yeah. good pleasure connecting with you again, um, as always. And I'm sure we'll have more to talk about soon. And I know just like we've alluded to, I know McPartland and small have more up their sleeve. They're, oh, right, that's you know, yeah, you know yeah. that's going to be coming down the pipeline in the next, if, if not really soon within the next few years, I'm sure we'll see um, more elaborations on the scheme. And I, you know, it's funny. Um, our first interview, I asked you if you had to pick a tax, if you had to pick a taxonomical model to go with, even though we know that none of them are good enough, which one would you choose? And you said, well, I really like, small and Cronquist and the way that they um, handled things. And so it's so funny that jump forward, you know, from the seventies, from when small and Cronquist first, uh, you know, published uh, their papers on that, you know, you jump ahead to 2020 and we've got McPartland and small coming together and, you know, essentially taking what they had started and just elaborating it into a more cohesive scheme based on, on what we know now. So um seems like we were on the right track <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah so um anyway uh for everyone listening or what or uh watching the audiogram of this on youtube um thanks so much for for tuning in with us um i'm sure we'll have more to share with you soon um but if you want to learn more about the real seed company go to the real seed um also uh quickseeds.com k-w-i-k seeds um dot com uh, find that we've got the story behind that name um i think in the last episode but um you can find angus there he's got great content and you know there are a lot of seed providers out there but um i don't i don't know if i've ever told the story about how you and i connected uh which might be kind of worthwhile to throw in here at the very end but the way that angus and i got connected was i had posted online a timeline of cannabis taxonomy that i was using for um some of my uh, seminars and stuff. And there was a bit in there about um, some of the work that Vavilov uh, particularly had done. And uh, you had commented on there and you were like, I don't, I don't know if this is quite right. And we got into this uh, very um, civilized discussion about our disagreements about trying to understand what was going on with the taxonomy here, which then led to, well, do you want to come on the podcast and we'll just talk about it. And it, it just, it was a, I don't know. It's it's really nice when you meet somebody that can um, disagree or criticize in a um, in a very respectful and and professional way, and and then that led me to look into the real seed company and all of the work that you do. And I just I continue to be impressed by your dedication to try to get the facts right, try to understand what we know, share it with people. And when something's wrong, you don't hesitate to say, hey, I was wrong about this, or I made changes to this. Um, I said this at this time, but now I think this. Um, that's unfortunately a rare trait in a lot of a lot of folks these days, but it's something that I uh, really, really appreciate. And that's that's how we came together and how these these discussions got started. So I thought it was cool to, to just share that. And um, I appreciate you being willing to give up so much of your time. I said this wouldn't be a Three hour interview, but here we are at two hours and forty minutes. Um, so collectively, we've got over <laughs> five hours of content just for, just between you and me talking. But I really appreciate you being willing to to carve out the time and and do this again. It's it's been awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jason. Thanks. Awesome. All right, everybody. If you want to learn more about Curious About Cannabis, as usual, you can go to cacpodcast.com. Also, um, as an aside, I don't know when this will come out, but I am working on finishing up the second edition of the Curious About Cannabis book. This paper is a large reason of why I have not released the second edition yet, because I got it pretty much ready to go. And then this paper dropped and I was like, well, now I have to rewrite my whole chapter on taxonomy um, to include all of this. And there's so much good info here. So um, that has been delayed, but it's still coming. So probably by uh, late summer uh, or early fall, um, the second edition of that book will um will hit the shelf. So be on the lookout for that. And if you want to support the work that, that I'm doing with these conversations and, and some of the cannabis education work that I'm doing at large, um, 
please head on over to patreon.com slash curious about cannabis and you can become a, a member, a patron. And basically on that platform, I try to release episodes as quickly as I get them edited so that patrons get early access. There's also bits and pieces of conversations that don't always make it in the final episodes. And I um, sometimes will package those up and, and release those to members to thank you for the support. And there's other ways I'm trying to um, figure out ways to, to thank everyone that's been supporting the work that I've been doing so far. So thanks to our patrons. And, and if you're interested in that, check that out. Otherwise, find Curious About Cannabis on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. And with that, thanks so much for tuning in, and I'll catch you next time. Take it easy and stay curious. Bye-bye. If you want to learn more about cannabis, you can check out the Curious About Cannabis book, available now on Amazon.com and other online book retailers. Curious About Cannabis podcast is presented by Natural Learning Enterprises, a science education company dedicated to the enhancement of public scientific literacy through education about the natural world. Curious About Cannabis is just one of several learning initiatives produced by Natural Learning Enterprises. To learn more, go to www.naturallearningenterprises.com or connect with NLE on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter.